we should start uh, the last day's morning session. Uh, buenos dias for yes. everyone. Uh, that's all I say in Spanish, and then I switch back to English. Uh, okay, this morning we have a, 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 a three presentation before the coffee. And the first presentation is by Cipek Kovacensky. Let me uh, turn a little bit about uh, Cipek. Um, she was a, a student, uh, a BA student uh, uh, on food and engineering and biotechnology in Te uh, Technion Israel Institute of uh, Technology. Got uh, her master degree um, in statistics uh, in Mexico, in the Instituto uh, de Investigaciones en Matemáticas Aplica uh, Aplicadas y Sistemas uh, at UNAM. Uh, her first uh, academic work was experiment, uh, uh, working as an experimentalist in immunology um, at the Institute of Investigaciones Biomedicas at UNAM. Uh, her interests uh, uh, are such that she had been working in statistical analysis and the interpretation of experimental data collaborating in many different projects, uh, among others, cystic Alzheimer's disease, uh, and so on. And now a collaborator uh, with uh, uh, Professor Vario in complex network models. And I can see my name also there. Yes, I think your, your name should be first and then, then the rest of the rest yeah. of the people anyway but i mean <laughs> uh, your uh, uh, presentation is about the geog geographical propagation of epidemics so please yes thank you yes well uh, i am going to present the work in collaboration with yes rafael barrio of course Timo Kasti from finland good Mundor, thor from iceland Nadia, Pablo, Cecilia, Matias from Argentina, and myself from Mexico. Okay. Uh, uh, the motivation of this work started uh, at first in the pandemic of the influenza that started in Mexico. Yes. And of course, uh, epidemiological models has, have been developed for a long time because of the interest in, in epidemics. Yes, there have been epidemics all the time. And well, we, we decided to contribute a little bit in, in this field. Yes, and then, well, COVID came and we all know what happened. We were all, all scared and we were all living something we didn't uh, dream we would be living. Yes, in the 21th century, uh, being in the uh, in midst of a pandemic and we don't know the disease and there is no vaccination, no therapy. It was, well, I, I don't have to, <laughs> to tell much about it. Yes, so I will explain um, uh, our model, what we can, uh, what was, uh, what we, we could uh, add to the model when we started. And then I will show you the work we did with this model, yes. So, um, sales model has been used for a long time, yes. But two main assumptions were in the basis of the model, yes. One is general homogeneous population, and the other one was equally probably interactions among people. And these two uh, assumptions are not realistic, yes? Uh, and then these models were uh, applied usually for a city, uh, for a big country, you know? But uh, for a small, uh, in Iceland, in Iceland, it worked very well. And then uh, it gave an idea of what's going on with larger places, yes? 
So we decided to try to solve this, uh, uh, to, to give more sensible, uh, a more sensible model. Yes. So our solution is this. <laughs> yes. We decided to divide the country or the area we wanted to model in small areas so that this uh, we can really assume that in the, within this area, if the population density is, is really more homogeneous, yes? So in each of the, of the squares, we took into account the real population density, yes? In this. And in each square, we, all, uh, we also put a sales model. And then the, the geographical uh, propagation of the disease could be between neighbors, long trips, either by air or terrestrial trips. And we had also this kind of trips, non-planned trips to anywhere, yes? To a small town or, or I decided to, uh, to go shopping, uh, in, I don't know, in Guanajuato, yes, because I, I needed to, so something, yes. So here, nu is the mobility. It's an important parameter we use. These random trips, we uh, thought about them as uh, kinetic energy, how much people do really travel to many places, and I, 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 and rho is the local population density. Yes, I will explain in more detail. This is the sales. Okay, sales is what is is susceptible, exposed. Exposed is a, a person who has already been in contact with a, a with an infected one, but he himself is not yet infected. Yes. After some time, that is the uh, incubation time, in the incubation, this is incubation because of the virus, yes? Many times the virus must be within the cell, so it propagates, so it's, it has more copies, and then the disease starts. And this is this incubation period. Then so you are infected, and after, Sometimes you are not anymore infective. The uh, recovered people are those who have the, which are already he healthy. And then this W is the time that you stay immune because of your contact with the disease. Yes. And X is the proportion of survival. Yes. And then after this immunity is not anymore present, you are susceptible like it. Yes, these are the equations. Yes. And, and these kind of equations have been used for many, for many years. What, what we added also, uh, not, it's not only this uh, geographical spread, but this is, a, 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 this is the incidence, incidence function, yes? And then usually this is uh, calculated using mass action law. But we thought that using a Poisson-like probability of contacts will include one contact, two constants, or as many contacts uh, as, uh, it, it just excludes the zero contact. <laughs> yes, this is the Poisson probability, just excluding the, the zero contacts. And then you have, um, this is susceptible, here you have infected. Beta is this transmission parameter. And it's very important because in this way, we have separated beta from rho. In the other models, rho influences beta. And then they had to, to calculate or estimate beta for each local locality they were. Yes. So this is a great advantage of our model because we did estimate this for Mexico and we use it, have used it in many countries. Yes, as I will show. 
ってね。Well, this is an, an explanation about how do, do we calculate this mobility. And these mobilities are, are uh, in fact, probabilities. Yeah? It's the probability of one people deciding to go for some reasons to his neighbors, to some neighbors. Eh? Yes, it could be that he goes usually to the supermarket here, or children to school, or restaurants, or whatever. Yes, this is the local displacement. And we calculated this as a Monte Carlo algorithm. Yes. Of the cell, it, it's the, about seven mit, uh, square meters. Yes, some mm -hmm. square meters. Well, then we also can take into account long, excuse me, long distance trips. In the first uh, model, we took uh, into account all the airports in Mexico. There are 50. Airports in Mexico, yes. But then in COVID, this was not so important because uh, many, many countries uh, stopped their flights. And in Mexico, it, they didn't stop, but people didn't fly. There was a, a very little people traveling, yes. So we used the roads because the train was not so used. But many people, for example, in Europe, did travel by car. Yes. And this is uh, the uh, thermal distance I spoke about. This uh, simulates uh, random decisions to go anywhere. And this was needed because uh, this is the way to, to reach every town or every city in Mexico, yes? In addition, of course, to the other way of dispersing the disease. These were our first, first results in Mexico, yes? So um, this is it, a map of density in Mexico. This is the map we used then, yes? And, and as you can see, the center is populated and you have big distances without population. And it's in, in here, it's the simulation adding only neighbor Traveling, yes, uh, dispersion only by traveling, uh, by neighbors. Excuse me. This uh, simulation was started here in Veracruz, in a little town. And as you can see in our model, it's it's like waves, but not so so beautiful waves because this is uh, this has uh, a random factor in there. Yes, and see after eighty. 800 runs, no runs, uh, steps. It seems to stop here. Yes. And it's just an effect of this zone that is not so popular. It's like a natural barrier. <laughs> yes. And here we use this neighbor cell traveling, but added kinetic energy. <clears throat> this is the effect of having this kinetic energy. And as you see, as then you really start to cover all the all the possible seat, uh, places. But then we also saw this effect. Yes. And here we added ten airports to the neighbor in, uh, traveling and to the kinetic energy. And then you see, we really covered all this all Mexico. Yes. Now I will I will be talking about COVID. Yeah. And I will be talking our uh, the, our four collaborations that are published in this area. Yes. I will be talking about how did we use the model for Mexico, Finland, and Iceland, yeah? And these are three countries that are very different in size, 
Yes, there are variety from uh, Iceland, for example, has uh, 300,000 inhabitants. And Mexico has uh, 127 million inhabitants. Yes, the areas are, are also very different. But what we were uh, seeking is to, to see how the model works. And also we can apply the knowledge we have about beta to Finland and to Iceland. Yes. Then uh, there was this knowledge about the asymptotic people, uh, as, uh, asymptomatic, suggested. the asymptomatic people, and then we included it in, in the model. Then we started to, to see how people must be vaccinated if we can have better strategies strategies than other. And the, the last uh, work we have published was using different variants of, of the virus. So, so you can see this history, what, what news <laughs> or what else new was known at the moment. These were our, our first are very impressive results. Because when we use the model for influenza, we were very happy we could adjust. <laughs> yeah. But for Mexico, this is the, 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 <clears throat> the map we use for density of the population. And these are the results. These are um, the blue line are the results, the, the the cases in Mexico accumulated. No, no, this was not, this is uh, really infected people that we have from March till April 13. Yes. And well, uh, Rafael uh, uh, did the calculations. He said, well, this, we are at the start of an exponential. The growth of the, the infection, and and with this growth, we can start estimating beta, epsilon. The, the time parameters were almost known. Yes, the the incubation uh, period was about five days. The immunity, no, the the infection time before you are infectious, uh, was estimated as the two weeks. Uh, that, that were obliged, that if you were ill, you had to stay at home 14 days, yes? So we took it as, as the parameter. And then at the time we stay immune, we didn't know. So we decided to, 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 to give it the value of um, four months. Well, well, so with these few data, uh, we estimated beta. We saw how how uh, the all the also the mobility parameter. In this case, we used the um, yes we, we used the two mobility parameters, Well, three the three mobility parameters. We estimated the the rate of travel of passing between neighboring suns. We included some aerial. Trips, and then the kinetic energy, the energy, this, this was important. And here I'm showing you uh, what I call a working graph, yes? Because this is how, this in blue are the data I show you in, in the last uh, slide. But then we started adding the real cases. Yeah. And it was really impressive how good they look. This is, this is a single simulation. Yes, this is not an average virus simulation. This is a single simulation. And this was until um, almost the end of, uh, no, the starting of June, the, the first uh, days in June. And then we had the prediction, prediction that the peak will be until July 20, 19, yes. And as you know, we were the group who, who really knew when it will be. All the conocid groups 
calculated that if it will be made. But we already knew that we have to be patient because this was not going to happen. Okay. And these are also uh, another adjustment. I, I, this green line are the data. In this case, this curve, this red curve is an average of 15 uh, or 50 simulations. Yes. And well, this is, this was uh, till September. As, and you can see, we weren't, we, we were able to predict five months of what was going to be. Afterwards, it, our prediction was not bad. It was within the 95 confidence percent. Yes. And, and then, uh, it, 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 as you see, it's not a bad prediction, not for being done nine months ago. So we decided. Yes, yes. No, I, I, and also, yes, it, it, this uh, campaign of staying at home started here. Uh, and it, it wasn't changed. Yeah? And, and it was not compulsory because it, it was not known that many people do live day by day. So it, it, they couldn't stay at home. Yeah? In addition to the compliance and all this. And, and another characteristic of the model is this is this not being so symmetric and these long tails that we've not seen. It's also a difference between our sales model and other sales models. Well, so we were very happy with our results. And we started collaborating with Finland and Iceland. And then we, we really wanted to simulate using the same parameters. So this is very good for a model because you don't have many, many parameters. You already, if you already have beta, you have epsilon, sigma, w, beta, and you just have to, uh, to adjust the, param the uh, mobility parameters. And mobility parameters also helped us to simulate what was going on with society, yes? Here, the, the red arrows are addition of restrictions. Yes, here, for example, there were some number of uh, restrictions, and here they added more restrictions. Here, the, the <coughs> green arrows are lifting restrictions, so here they're lifted, and also here. But then we also could add a social event. That was a super spreader event. Yes. And without the spreader events, also here and also here, we couldn't model these peaks, the sudden rise of the. So you can see that the model, if we took into account what was going on with, with non pharmaceutical restrictions, we could really model quite well what was going on. Iceland was especially uh, difficult because there were so many, so few cases. Yes, you can see here, 300. Uh, I didn't emphasize, of course, in Mexico, there were more. But here they had, the peak was 80, 80 infections. Yes. And then all this stoch stochasticity starts to, play an important role or, or you can't catch it's so beautiful data as when you can average and everything looks better. <laughs> yes. And then Iceland was difficult to, to model, but we succeed. Yes. 
And well, this, this was where our first predictions also. This red line was an average of 50 realizations. This is the 95% confidence uh, interval. And this, we, we simulated till here. And this was uh, uh, calculated lifting the restrictions. Yes. As, as you see, well, they were necessary. Yes. Here, this is the same experiment, and the experiment lifting the restrictions. And then in Iceland, again, you have so few cases that although it's, uh, you would have more cases, it still goes down. Mm -hmm. Because of natural things, yes, Iceland, as you see, the population in Iceland. Here, non populated <laughs> and some population as <laughs> well. Yes. Well, well, these were the results from our first work. And then, as I said, we had the knowledge that um, many of the people are asymptomatic. And if they are asymptomatic, they didn't check themselves and they're circulated as always. So they infected many people. And it was not a small ratio of, I don't know, so like, but of this asymptomatic uh, population. There were a lot. Yeah, they, they, the estimation was uh, about, uh, about 80% of infected people, yes. So we decided to include these isolated people that they, they got infected, they got detected, and then you isolate them. Yeah. And this is uh, also because, for example, in Iceland, they were able to track uh, uh, every all the population yes, without uh, having symptoms. They had they they did on them a PCR, so they were really tracking everybody, and they could isolate all the infected people, as you see also in the results. Yes, they haven't a big big problem. Yes. So well, I will I will not show you this the equation because it's just adding another compartment, and we added these two parameters, alpha is the time between getting infected and uh, being detected. Yes. You get infected and then it, it passes some time and you are detected. And P is the proportion of people isolated. Mm -hmm. this, uh, this work was done using Argentine, not medicine. Yes. And again, we didn't uh, estimate beta uh, newly. We used the beta we have estimated. Yes. And this is the adjustment for Argentinian data, the, the red uh, curve. And the blue bars are the real data. Yes. And this is also what, what would happen without restrictions. And then, here you can see another uh, characteristic of our model. It does simulate various waves and not only. We didn't uh, have to start again or something. This is a result, a continuous result of the equations. These are not the model. And as you see, these are isolated people. And when you uh, put the infected, really infected, taking into account in this case, that there are 90% of infected people. This is how, how it looks like, yes? Infected versus detected. Well, uh, these were the experiments to see how much does alpha influence in the calculations. And then it's important to, to say that here, P was a constant, the proportion of the detected. And the proportion of the detected was very small. And we think that this was quite, a, we couldn't see a great effect when, when changing alpha. Yes. This graph uh, shows the values of, of alpha 
against the totally infected uh, cases here. This, this, these are these points, but uh, here you have the value of alpha that was used. Yes, and you see that it really grows, it's the tendency, but see the numbers, very, very little effect, yes? And these are the graphs uh, uh, for changing P, the proportion of people detected. So isolated people, you have, uh, as P grows, uh, uh, you have more detected people, yes? But here you see, uh, then it comes uh, a, a moment then that you have very few infected, so you can detect no more cases, yes? And then the, this, proper, this uh, number even drops mm -hmm. yeah. because you are really stopping the infection, yes? When you are detecting already 60% uh, of, the, of the infected people, you won't have so many infected people. Yes. And of course, uh, if you look at the infected people, they do decay as you Detect, detect more effectively. And well, with this data, we also could demonstrate another important characteristic of our model. In big countries like Argentina and Mexico, the, the epidemic is not synchronized in different geographic areas. And then here, we uh, took uh, uh, separately, this, area, this red area is the uh, area uh, around uh, um, Rio de Janeiro. No, I will traveling to, oh yes, what was I? I traveled to Brazil, uh, uh, near uh, Buenos Aires. Yeah. This is this red curve. And these uh, bars are green right there. Yes. And then, is separately, we looked at the rest of the country. As you see, it's not synchronized. And again, these uh, green bars are real data. So even though it's an important characteristic uh, uh, how epidemics move within a country, in a large country, uh, it wasn't so, uh, nobody, it has to uh, pay attention to it. Yeah. And it was very obvious, for example, in, in the United States, the pandemic started in New York, and then some months later, it, it reached, well, a month later, <laughs> it reached the other coast of the, of the, the United States. Yeah. So, so this, we will also put a, a learn because of having this geographical spread within the model. The next uh, thing we wanted to investigate was what about vaccines. And when I read, I reread this paper, I was really, uh, I think how, how quick um, our knowledge was going on, yes? Because we started uh, uh, this model before vaccines were administered. I, I guess it was when Russians said that they had already the vaccine, all, also the Chinese, but for example, um, uh, Pfizer was not ready, yes? And then we started to speculate, but how uh, would you have to, uh, admin, uh, to, to administer so many vaccinations to be more efficient, yes? Uh, well, and, and then, the new compartment was vaccination. And the uh, added parameters was delta, the time that you stay immune because of the vaccine, and then uh, the vaccination rate. Yes, how, how quick, are you, how many people you, you can vaccinate in, in a day? And I, I stress that this is uh, before vaccination was started, 
because then there was this plan of the coup of the World Health Organization that we must be careful to distribute vaccines to all the world because if there are infections everywhere, we don't have we don't want to keep it. For example, the infection high in Africa because it's a, 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 a no, yes, it could spread afterwards. Yes, but but it's a, a reservoir of the infection. It's not good for anybody. Yes, this was not as you know. Yes, but we were optimistic then, <laughs> and then we started simulating. This was also done with Argentina, the, the map of Argentina. Yes, and we started simulating first uh, first assumption that the vaccine will really prevent infection. We didn't know how long we will be immune because of the, of the uh, vaccines. So we took so, uh, it's, uh, 120 days, 180 days, and one year, yes, and we we tried two strategies. We knew the, we, the, there would won't be sufficient vaccines for all the world simultaneously. Yes, so the the World Health Organization recommended to start uh, vaccinated three percent of the. You don't see the other one. I'm sorry. We started uh, 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 vaccinated three percent uh, of the population. After some time, you you would uh, be able to achieve, to have more vaccinations, and then uh, you could complete uh, having twenty percent of the uh, people vaccinated, and then you will be able to achieve more uh, vaccines and vaccinate more people. Yes. And this was what we, we did here. And we also uh, investigated which, uh, how we will be more efficient to uh, um, distribute these vaccines that you have among all the population, homogeneously between all the population, or you could uh, decide, no, uh, uh, high cities, high uh, populated cities, are a problem when the disease is spreading. So you could uh, give a uh, start vaccinated this density, it's uh, populated in places, yes? And as you see, for example, uh, if the immune period is short, then the epidemic will start again very soon, yes? Then you will have another peak. And it's better to vaccinate high density places because if, if you are too democratic, you will have more people in front. Yes. And this is, this is the same. And here you see also that, that the, how can you get this uh, low infection rate depends on uh, on Delta, of, uh, on the time that uh, you are a, a, that you say immune, but it also depends on how you apply vaccines. And this was less op less optimistic, yes, because here uh, we started uh, vaccinated, and and then a month later we had more vaccines. And then 19 like, uh, days later, from the start of vaccination, you had more vaccines. But here we said, no, we are too optimistic. Let's say that you have the first uh, vaccines at this uh, time, and you will have more vaccines two months later, 60 days, and then another two months till you get more vaccines. Yes, And here you can see that if the period you stay with that vaccination is too long, and here it's not too long, it was longer, yes, then we will, you will also have a peak. This peak ended because the vaccination started here again. 
And then the same effect, yes? If you vaccinate it the, the great cities, the densely populated uh, places, you have a better, you have a better result than uh, vaccinating everything. Well, this this was done also uh, trying to see how many people you have to vaccinate it to have herd immunity. Herd immunity is a, an epidemiological con uh, concept, yes. It doesn't have to do, to do with immunity. Here you see that I want with immunologists uh, for a while. Yes, uh, because it would be good that if I'm vaccinated and you come to do, do it with me, you are also vaccinated. But this doesn't help. You don't, the, the, the immunity doesn't, it's not transferred. One. But the herd immunity is an epidemiological concept. And the goal of the herd immunity is lowering the, the, infect, the, the infected people, or um, it's better to think uh, on the other way around. If you have less susceptible people, then the infection cannot, it will not transmit. This is the concept, yes. And here you see that even uh, in, in Argentina, if you have vaccinated 60% of the population with this, with this uh, vaccination strategy, you won't get this in, because here we stop the, the, the simulation, yes, but this is still growing. This is in the case that immunity stays for, for um, six months, yes. But if the immunity stays for one year, it will be a lot better, of course. Yes. And then here you, you don't see this, uh, this, is, this 60%. Here we really achieved, at least for a while, herd immunity. And then the, the, these were the countries that we investigated. These are the maps used for these uh, simulations. And in this map, you can here uh, see the density of the population and also the main roads of each country. Yes. And here, well, I, I give the data so you can see. The, because uh, uh, Spain should be in much, much smaller. If I wanted to do it comparative, yes. Well, then uh, I will show you just to, to show you the importance of of the geography. Here we we have three simulations uh, comparing Argentina and Spain. Be careful because this is a, a simulation till uh, 60, uh, 600 days, and these are uh, simulations. Uh, till thousand days. Yes? So here we simulated a year pass, pass, and then you start vaccinating again. Yes, and another uh, uh, parameter we were using here we we had low mobility, here we had medium mobility, and here we had a, a high mobility. And what I want to stress is that the difference in the kinetics between Argentina and Spain is not so much about how many people do live in these countries. It's about geography. Yes, here you see, you, you need less uh, vaccines in Argentina than in Spain for achieving herd immunity. Yes, and then if you have uh, 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 more mobility, then you see it's uh, easier to see the difference. This, these lines at the top at what would have happened without vaccines. Yes. So you see, without vaccines, Argentina is better than Spain. <laughs> Once you have vaccinated this period, yes. And then see what happens with high mobility. Argentina is not so... <laughs> So dispersed, and, and here in Spain, see what, what, what would have happened. Okay, 
And this is the comparison, comparison between Argentina and Mexico. As you see, it's much more similar because of the geographic spread. It's very impressive. Yes. And then again, this is um, what would have happened without vaccines. And this is uh, uh, when, when we vaccinate, uh, but only one year. No, in, in, in homogeneous, giving vaccines to everyone. And this is uh, if you vaccinate in populated places. So this is uh, what we did with the vaccination. And then we started worrying about new variants. Yes. And, and we added, it, it's, uh, the model really looks uh, more, more complicated. It is more complicated because in the model itself, we allowed interactions between uh, variants. But we didn't use interactions to simulate because there were very, very few reports, case reports, about uh, people who were infected with two or more variants. Yes, and there were really rare cases and special cases. So in the simulation for, for adjusting the data, we didn't use this possible interaction. But as you, you see, it's still a C, E, C, E, E, D, C, with vaccination. Why, why uh, this the picture is more uh, is spread? Because then you can get infected with any of the variants of, uh, of the virus. The incubation time can be different. This uh, infectious time can be different. And then uh, recover people are the same. <laughs> yes, then you have this, uh, also the time you to stay immune because of the infection might be different for each variant. And then he, we took into account that uh, people get vaccinated. This is uh, the rate of vaccination that you saw it has a great effect. And then uh, there is a possibility. This, this is the probability of being vaccinated for one variant, but getting, uh, but, uh, getting ill because you are infected with another virus. Our first tries were not on a country, but on two squares. This is a square simulating homo a homogeneous population and, of course, heterogeneous population. And these uh, black uh, spots are the places where the infection starts. We took um, uh, we took three variants in these simulations, and each variant is one third uh, uh, infects uh, the, the, the 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 you have a, a the, the, the all the virus uh, population is divided in one third one and one it just each is one third of the tot, uh, of the total viruses that, that exist, of course, at the start of the simulation. And then these are these, the results. We got, and see how um, another feature of this, uh, of this model was that we decided that when this, the first variant ex existing reaches a certain number, of cases, then it mutates, it has the, the opportunity to mutate, and the second variant exists. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, uh, yes, it's apparent. And then when the second variant it reaches to us, uh, some level, a third variant appears. Okay. So as you see, when you use an homogeneous map, the three even though they didn't start at the same time, here it's not visible, but, but they don't uh, start at the same time. The three variants synchronized very beautiful. <laughs> and this is, well, with different betas. This is, of course, the, the highest, the medium one and the, the lower beta. 
And you see that also with different uh, uh, characteristic, uh, characteristics of, of the variants, you have different ways of, the set, of uh, lowering the amount of effect. But the synchronization is really impressive. And then I will show you this. This is the, the similar. This is what's going on. You saw the colors. <laughs> you, you have first, I will put it again. You have first been. The blue stray, then the orange one, then the green one, and then they are synchronized. So, so the color is what is the sum of the three in the proportions <laughs> we saw. Early. Yes. Well, then this is what happened with the heterogeneous work. Again. This is the influence of geography. And then these are more or less synchronized, but you have seen them all the time doing not really the same. Yes. This tendency to, to lower the effect, to have the infection low, lower by, by itself is also seen here, but not as clear. But no, it's, it's yes. Here, with different times of immunity, you, you really can lower infection. Uh, and, and I will show you here the move. This move is, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, okay. No, excuse me. Yes, the, these movies were done by Nadia. And see how it goes. Here it's interesting because in this spot, it seems that the only one variant uh, was there. And then we don't, uh, we're not so puzzled about it. But biologists always start to think, oh, we have to look to the, the genetic there because people might be immune to the other variants or, or reasoning like, like this, yes? But it uh, might also be hazard. And the last slide, the slide is on this. This is uh, in, for variants, we use the, the England. Because England was the country with, which have more information about really uh, uh, looking at uh, which variants they have. And this is the adjustment of, of the data. You can't really see much, but the, the, this uh, thing, thing is the simulation. <laughs> and, and the slashes uh, uh, and the dotted uh, line are in real data of the variants. And we, we were able to adjust it very well. Again, just it, it, what changes from variant to variant was big. This was the only thing we changed. And this is the vaccination rate. Also, the, the real data are dashed and simu the simulated Vaccination rate is the continuation. Well, this is the adjustment. So, conclusions. Yes. We have a, a very versatile model, which accounts for heterogeneous density populations. The mixing of the population was also taken into account. I, I didn't mention how, excuse me. but um, it, it can be used in many different countries. Once you know the, the parameters, you don't have to calculate them or to estimate them again. 
the model distinguish between this uh, beta that is uh, that is uh, depending on the virus and the density of the population. So it has a very you you can see also these effects apart one from the other, um, uh, in particular this beta. Yes, and then uh, the mobility parameters help us reflect social behavior. Yes, so we could also include social behavior. And if varying them on time, we were able to, to simulate this non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions. And also this uh, super spread events. And uh, this allowed us to predict some, some scenarios. Yes. When using our model, precise that is not needed. Yes, because now it's the tendency to gather data because we have many data available, yes. But we didn't, we didn't do it in this way. So it's uh, sometimes easier to use this, this model. And well, and this is due, we think, because we are really catching this intrinsic random of this spreading. And then another two characteristics are that um, we predict several waves, as you saw. We did, we don't uh, stop. Uh, we don't, we can't. And also these uh, asymptotic, uh, uh, these uh, long tails are not the uh, are not seen with all of them. Okay, thank you, Chipe. This was most comprehensive work I ever seen in terms of COVID, uh, <laughs> COVID nineteen, and uh, <laughs> and uh, I think it has a great future. Future, yeah. I mean, applicability as well. Uh, there are a few questions. I think I see for you. Well, I, I was going to, well, first of all, congratulations. I think it's, it's really great work. And I was going to ask you about applicability. Have you been in touch with the, I don't know, decision makers in any of these ah, countries to use oh, these sort it, of yes. predictions? Okay, so you haven't. But no, there is. No, but in Argentina, yes, no, Pablo is somehow. Okay, okay, I, I would love to hear that. And for, for Mexico, what I would suggest is that there is a library that uh, the university is putting together all the work on COVID. Ah. Because this is not the end of it. I mean, there will be another epidemic. And well, hope not very soon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I hope that not very soon. Yes, yes. So I, I would suggest to put this in this, uh, <clears throat> because Everything has been compiled, and I know the people who's doing that, so we can uh -huh. talk about that later uh, okay. on. Okay. And this okay. could be included in this review of what the university did for the COVID. Okay, so it will be there, and it might be used eventually. I hope not too soon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes, I do, I do. Okay, so we'll do that later. Okay, I we'll do that later. But I would love to hear what happened in Argentina with this and the vision. We are very sorry, but Nadia couldn't come with us, yes, because of personal things. And she's the one who knows better what, what happened with the, the government. Yes, yes, I guess not, not much. Because uh, Pablo Cocal Volcato, uh, it says he, you, you know. Mm -hmm. So, in some sense, uh, yes, he, no he showed our the results, but I don't know if the the impact of this. Yes. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. Thank you. Any any further questions, comments, Miguel? 
thank you, Sylvia, for the nice speech. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, uh, because the, the data that the uh, Mexican government delivered during the pandemic mm -hmm. was uh, disaggregated by geographical regions. I mean, the I states, yes. I, at least we could, we could read mm -hmm. uh, how, how every state was evolving uh -huh. the, the epidemics. Yes, yes, that's right. And, and this data, in some way, I, I have the feeling that can can uh, help or at least uh, be compared. Be, be, yes, as we did with we can, Argentina, we can see the evolution, the geographical. Have you tried to no. predict or compare? Or <laughs> no, we we, we we were running after the information we had. <laughs> yeah, no, we all we only tried to, to demonstrate that we could with the same parameter data adjust Finland, Ireland, Mexico, Argentina, Spain, e England. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. And, and well, in Mexico, I was very conscious, for example, for uh, in Monterrey, because I have some family in Monterrey. And it, it started uh, almost a month later than in the, than in, Mexico City, yes. Yes, I, I, and you are right. We, we could compare what was going on in in state in every state or in regions. Yes. Mm -hmm. And my final question is: uh, this uh, frequency of for infection that you are finding in the uh -huh. part of the study, do you think is uh, and is the period of, that we could find in the kids? It's going to be specific of well, every country uh, or to be general. Uh, uh, in, in the last, uh, 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 yes, uh, 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 yes, uh, this in England. It, it has to do. Yes. Then, it, the immunity is very. Yes, yes, the immunity is the one which can uh, avoid the. Yes. We can also have one one more quick question or comment. If not, uh, let's give a big hand to Chip. Thank you. So the next uh, presentation is uh, the senior researcher, senior researcher at, uh, at the Institute of Renewable Energies at, of the UNAM. His background is in physics, uh, graduated in science faculty of National Autonomous University of Mexico, uh, UNAM, and has a degree in solar energy and PhD in physics from the Autonomous University of the state of Morelos. He was also working with me as a postdoc uh, for a couple of years uh, from 99 to 2001. And during that time, uh, there was a, a daughter born who is here. Uh, so she's uh, half finished at least. Earlier, I think those uh, who were born in one country, like my uh, my uh, second son was born in the uh, UK, so got uh, naturally the citizenship. So at, at least I consider you a half finished anyway. And I'm happy to see you in good health because there was some difficulties uh, uh, 
at the time. But, uh, so uh, Miguel is going to give us a presentation uh, uh, with the title of Using Networks in the Study of Wind Dynamics at the Regional Scale. Okay. So is it working, the sound? Yes. Okay. So uh, now is we are changing the subject. Uh, my the topic I'm going to present is more related with energy. I came from the Renewable Energy Institute, so what we are trying to do there is to make some science that that could help to the renewable energy sources to be used or improve it uh, uh, for all the the different. Uh, topics and wind is one of the recent topics that has been working there and of course the dynamic of winds is one of the matter to study because uh, it's one of the most complex systems that we have in nature at least in, in in our planet and then it's always interesting to to model and and to find things there so i'm going to uh, uh, present now uh, some work, and I don't know if it's working. I don't know, if, uh, it's not working this, but here. Okay, so what I want to present in this short presentation is basically three points. I, I want to address something about the problem of the power assessment uh, uh, of the wind. One of the topics that uh, we is very important now for the for the installation of of uh, power plants is to uh, guess where where to put a power plant and, and how to use it in, in, in an optimized way. So the wind resource, the evaluation of the wind resource is something that is always all the time uh, very important and taking in account. But I, I'm going to do it, uh, uh, this for, uh, for, uh, for going a step forward and trying to in, introduce some definitions that can help to understand the dynamics of wind, uh, like a complex system. And then I will talk about a little uh, of a definition of what I call the wind states. And uh, at the end, I will centrate with uh, a problem that what happens when you have a region, a geographical region now, uh, where you have information in very local parts of these regions and try to understand how is the dynamics in the whole region. So the problem is, is related with the scales at the end. Wind can be modeled at, at different scales and data that we have from the wind is, is always at, at one scale and the understanding that we would like to have is an, in another scale. So I'm going to talk about it and I will start now with this. I don't know if this is going to work because it's connected to the net. And I don't know if my computer is connected or well connected. Let's see if it works. No, I think it's not working. I don't know if I, sh I didn't connect. Well, nowadays, the understanding of wind could be very impressive. I mean, this is, for example, this is a screenshot of a dynamic simulation that you can find in the in internet. Here is the, the address. And you can see how the wind moves in the whole planet. So models can reach this level of understanding of wind using data from every parts of the world and uh, some, uh, uh, and some uh, fluid dynamics is possible to to try to find in some way how the winds are moving and some specific date of, of, uh, in the world. And then our understanding at this scale, we could see that this impressive well, but it's not necessary, complete or very useful when we talk about uh, using the wind as a power source. Normally, 
what we use to evaluate the, the power as the, 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 the fiability, the availability in one specific site, what we need is to have data from uh, weather stations and, and weather stations are limited in, in countries and especially in Mexico, we have not many weather stations located. This is the number, uh, most of the weather stations that are connected to the network of Conagua. So this is one important, of the, maybe the, the most important source of information on, on weather uh, data. And always, is this less, lesser working? Uh, okay, so, and what, what we have is very specific sites during the country that could allow to make models at this scale. But it's not necessary that this model could give good information if we want to use it to, to build a plant, a wind farm in a specific site. One of the problems is that always when we have to make a specific uh, site, use in a specific site, we have always to, to gather data during some time. And this time could be two years. So the developing of projects of wind would take many years because the assessment take years. So then the understanding of uh, theoretical models and data and this relation between them is very important to accelerate this process, to try to accelerate this process. That's one of the motivations to understand how the dynamics of, of data and the dynamics of the real uh, fluid uh, of, uh, is very important. And then uh, what we have, uh, ha have been doing is to try to understand how, how the data of these stations work and how can we interpret it, the dynamics of, of, uh, of wind. What do we have normally? Let me see if it, it works. A weather station reports the, the wind speed in a time series like this. So, and it's evolving during many, many days and gathering perhaps in time series of 10 minutes. And then we can more or less understand the statistics of this, of this, uh, of this speed, of this velocity. And normally, what we do is to try to understand the statistical properties of these distributions and try to assess how, how a power plant, on the basis how a power plant could, could work on the basis of the full statistics during perhaps a couple of years. Uh, but the, the power production is related with the technology that you put there. Of course, we have to have information. And of course, also with a very kind of random dynamics uh, is what could happen in the power generation. And predicting the power generation is also a, a, a big issue for the, for the people that is developing the technology. So nowadays is one important subject, subject. But anyway, this prediction is, ba is based most of the times on what we know here, on the statistics here. But this is statistics is, is one specific side that is beautiful and well behaved. Not, it's not always like that. Reality is a bit more complex, but one interesting thing is that data could be regarded not only as, as the magnitude of the velocity, but also with the direction. And when we plot, for example, the, instead of the speed, the velocity, the time series is a two dimensional time series behaves like that, like this. This is one example of one specific site located in Oaxaca. In, uh, in, the, in one of the best sites that we have in, in Mexico and in the world to produce energy, wind energy. What we can find there is that most of the time of many days, of many hours, the wind is in this region. So this is, 
this indicates that we have uh, strong speeds in a, a specific direction. So this is the reason why this site is very good to produce energy the whole year, because all the time you have a, a kind of a wind current that is right in the in the in the with the properties to produce energy. But if we see this this uh, plot like a density plot, we can find that wind locate in a specific regions. It doesn't cover randomly the whole space. So it's located and well defined. And that's why, that's why we are looking always to, to find a good place to produce wind power. So that means that in the quest to look wind power is equivalent to the quest to find sites where these regions appear well defined. And this region resembles what we physicists think like states in a kind of phase space. So this phase space is very small because it's only velocity, two variables, two degree freedoms of degree. And define a very well defined region that have some random properties. And these random properties could be uh, thinking th can be to talked like a like a Gaussian distribution in a in a by in a two variable Gaussian distribution. So one way to think the dynamics of this thing could be like extracting kind of states that are well defined for this site. But remember that. This is data from one weather station in one place specific geographically. So of course it's connected to the wind that is happening all over the world, but it's very local information. This is, we have much, many times, but in a, in a punctual site. So that's, that is the disadvantage. But anyway, we can think that this data, this is the same graph, but uh, not in a density plot, but in a histogram plot. What we can observe is that we can apply clustering methods in order to find this, this uh, what we are calling states, and then trying to decompose the data like a Gaussian decomposition, and we could characterize any of these regions where we assume that would be a wind state. And that's the way that how we are reaching a definition of a wind state. So the wind state will be defined by the random variable that happens uh, in a specific situation, in a specific site that follows a Gaussian distribution in the in the velocity space, in the two-dimensional velocity space. And then the dynamics of a site is dominated by the dynamics, the random dynamics of the state, how it spreads and how it distributes in this in this velocity space. So that means that uh, this one state can be characterized by a function, distribution function, that is not, is nothing more than a normal distribution function in two dimensions. And then is, is, uh, is characterized by the mean and the covariance matrix. So is what we have to know about it. And then this also can allow us to classify the, the wind dynamics using few states, four, five, six states. And then we can discretize also this space and think that uh, the time series could be converted in a discrete wind state time series. And then we could 
try to figure out how dynamics between these states happen and trying to understand in a in a the discrete physical way instead of in a, in a continuous way. That's something where we have been trying to do, at least for some uh, different situations and for some sites. This is one example, of course, of, of one of these sites in, in, in Oaxaca. This is one year of the time series, and these are the five states that we could classify using uh, this uh, these uh, clustering methods. And the inter interesting thing is that we are connecting uh, these uh, machine learning methods with a um, physical definition to study the dynamics of different sites. Of course, these lead us, for example, to, to calculate, for example, transition matrix, because we, if we have discrete st states, we can characterize one site by its transition matrix, how the probability is from, from going to one state to another. And we can find, for example, tr forbidden transitions in this, this dynamics, or we can find the most important transitions that, that could occur. And this is giving us more information about, or at least, a rich information on how the dynamics of a site goes. No, it's a yearly, one year. We did it for one year. Yes, it's per year. But uh, of course, the time definition could be uh, also changed. I mean, this, this was for one year. Yes, exactly. And then this matrix is the characteristic of a site, for example, would characterize a site. Uh, that was the initial of the concept that we have trying to, to work with. Of course, it reaches uh, 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 a lot of questions. For example, immediately we can ask, does these states really, really exist or it's just a, a, a figure that appears from the data. I don't, so they are really questions that we can do. And there are a huge amount of questions, physical questions that we can reach. We have not yet answered much of these questions, but we have been trying to, for example, do some uh, kind of uh, explanations using basic physics. For example, we, we have trying to connect this to to numerical simulation using uh, computational fluid dynamics in a very uh, simplified model, for example. Uh, we have, for example, we, we did a calculation with obstacles that could be anything. It could be buildings or it could be mountains. I don't know. But if we simulate the computational fluid dynamics and try to change the income velocities to this cell, for example, and we randomize it, the conditions and the insight, we can try to figure how specific sites behave. And we are observing is that if we enter uh, a random, a uh, bivariate random Gaussian in the borders, sites behave like this also having this kind of states. So we have some numerical evidence that physically, it, this is what we are observing locally, this kind of distributions. So it really exists with, with, with we have random uh, boundary conditions. So at least we think that these states, this is not a show that really exists, but they should be related with a state that comes from from outside this cell. So this is connected with the dynamics of the whole region, I mean, the, the extended region, so in some way. And this leads us, lead us to try to, to, to find in our data 
some specific regions and where we can, could have, for example, more than one point, more than one weather station. In this simulation, we, we have, for, for example, located three points and try to figure out how it behaves. But in reality, we found a site, for example, in Mexico, where we have four stations in Zacatecas, where we have enough data. And uh, distributed in a, in a short, let's say, a kind of a small region. Okay, thank you. So every every data have a kind of distribution. I, I am sorry that this doesn't work very fine, but we can extend this, the analysis of states for every station and try to correlate them and see how dynamics could be reconstructed for the full region. But the problem is that when, when we do that, we find that if we have a small number of states and we, and we want automatically to connect with each other, but we have a lot of possibilities. And it's very hard work to start to trying to correlate. I mean, of course we can do it uh, in many ways, but what we are really doing is that connecting this with this, with this, this, with this, with this, and all of them. And what we are really doing, what we have figured out, is that we are constructing a network of states. So if we make a calculation of a correlation function, we can establish how some, some of the States, this, uh, this is a discrete state in one station, this is a discrete state in another, we can correlate them and measure how much they are correlated. And then we can, for example, establish a criteria to, to, to know the strongest correlations and then to define a network between the states in every, in every, in every, in every site. So this network now can be treated using methods of classifying networks. And then we can try to, for example, find the communities. And I'm going to say here, for example, applying some algorithms to find communities in these networks. And then trying to interpret what does, be, what does mean belonging to the same community in terms of, of the physical dynamics. And uh, since I have the time finishing, this is, this is what we have obtained. Let me, I hope this works. This is a video. This is the dynamics of the velocities coming from the data. The colors of, of the velocities, you can see that are changing between red, green, and blue. The colors means the community where the network was uh, appearing there. And we are finding that, that uh, the algorithm of, of, uh, of the communities, what is finding, let me make some pause just to observe it. Oh. Let me see if I can do it here. For example, here. What we can see is that when we have the same colors in two stations, sometimes this, this resembles a, a current that is happening here. So what, what is happening is that the community analysis is allowing us to classify where, when two, two stations are not only synchronized, but are, are behaving like, like a regional state. And let's see, for example, this, is, this example, it seems that this current that is moving the wind in these two places, but here, is not affecting in the same way. So we can identify like states region in the full region and states that are very local. 
the geography of each site is different. So it could happen that there are states in this site, for example, that doesn't exist here, very particular. And then the community analysis seems to extract this information. So this, it seems that this is uh, a reliable technique to trying to understand and or to scale up the point data to uh, regional data. So that's something that we are trying to figure out how to, how to improve and how to move to different scales. That is the interesting part. So I have to close then that with final remarks. And uh, the first is that uh, these wind states that we are trying to define should be a combined effect between this locality of the data and, and, the, and the randomness of the hydrodynamics, real hydrodynamics uh, of wind. And the ma machine learning and network techniques may assist to understand and try to scale or to think. The network modeling, in fact, have sense to connect all this and make it uh, automatically. This is the interesting thing. Uh, and we're, well, we are, of course, trying to, to go up in the scales or down in different depending on the problem. For example, we are doing for a region, but we have, we can do, try to do it for a whole country and to, to evaluate how, how a country can have a state of wind, or let's say in some way. Uh, and that's, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um... Thank you, Miguel. Most interesting and most relevant in today's energy crisis, indeed, and uh, uh, in terms of the renewable energy and uh, and carbon-free energy, I should say, also. So we have uh, questions. Of course, uh, Julia first, and then uh, Cecilia, and then Humberto. Well, I, I want, well, congratulations. Um, I want to um, advise you to talk to Gerardo Garcia now because he's working with yes, clouds. Yes, I, I know. And of course, this is completely related. Yes, I know. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I yes. think that that could be a very good. And I also would like to mention that there is a very good group on technology in wind power in the Institute. And they are designing a new wind power machine. And it's going to be a attempting machine. And they are using these sort of results because, of course, the, the, the technology depends on the speed and the quality of the That's all. Thank you. Yes, uh, the, of course, data that we can uh, uh, achieve for, for this kind of studies are data that you collect by years. And then we can estimate the presence of a state during this, let's say one, two years, if perhaps three years, if you have uh, more data. And then you can find the presence of these states uh, in this time scale, in time of years. And uh, it's interesting that, of course, the structure of the states depend very much on the site. Uh, uh, for example, this site in Oaxaca is impressive because they have states that, that remains a lot of time. 
so and remains in the whole set of data. No? And then there are states that are always there and they live actively, they are activated during very long periods of time, it means weeks. So it's a lot uh, for a place, but this is, is, is what it gives this site to be the, the best site to produce energy in Mexico, that is La Ventosa in Oaxaca. This, is La Vent this data was in La Ventosa and clearly is the ideal place to produce energy there. But in, an, in other sites, you can, you can uh, disassemble how these times behave. So uh, the ideal was there, but we, you can find other places where different technologies can, can be used. And that is the interesting thing. For example, in La Ventosa, of course, you have the, be the best way, way to, uh, uh, to use it is to bring a very a huge generator uh, with a huge turbine and produce as much as you can. But, but in another place, you can find different technologies because uh, perhaps some, some states are better to produce energy for a small, for a small generator or for a, for a vertical instead of horizontal generator. So, and the, you can extract it from the, from the structure of data. So that's, that's uh, information that can, can bring. And the, the last question you say was about uh, hurricanes, yes. Of course, I think could be, could be discovered, but first, hurricanes are very short time events. So it's difficult to appreciate like a state, at least in these time scales, but you can focus on try to find it, but you need more time. Uh, I agree also very interesting uh, research. Uh, two questions. Uh, how this could relate with eco technologies? How, how, how at, at, at what scale you can go down in order to, for a, a poor community to have something that provides uh, some energy to them in, in not a very expensive way. And the other thing I, I would like also to ask you is whether you are in touch with government or uh, private uh, uh, interested company uh, to do developments. Well, I, I am not in touch with any company or I am still in, in, in the academic stage. So, of course, uh, the, the tool I think is useful to develop uh, small scale generators, for example, and to try to find where to adapt one, one technology if you have it ready and, and characterize it for one wind state, for example, or for, for a set of states, then you could find where to use it. We are trying to connect this, this uh, state analysis with this, the, with the reanalysis simulations of the whole country, for example, in order to, to, to jump the need to have the weather stations data and use the data generated by simulations in, in a huge scale. Because if you connect that and you learn how to do it uh, in the best way possible, then you can evaluate any site in the country. So this is something that we are trying. It's not simple, but, but we believe that it's possible. Okay. Let's, let's thank you. Thank uh, Miguel once again. Give a big hand. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have to move on. Uh, next uh, uh, presentation is uh, for me, collaborator of, of mine. Um, uh, Ricardo, how I see you? And uh, Ricardo is currently a um, member of National System of uh, Researchers and invited to researcher of, at the Complexity Science Center of UNAM, 
where he's leading uh, the project, the science of metrics, uh, complexity, and science of science. Uh, indeed, uh, Ricardo has a, a long history in, in terms of uh, 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 focusing his, his work and st on studies of productivity and scientific collaboration. And uh, has published five, uh, five monographs and 100 research articles managing in innovation and scientific activities in Cuban biopharmaceutical bio, uh, institution and in collaboration with Schimago Research uh, Group in Spain and then International Network of, for the Availability of Scientific Information in UK. Ricardo, please. Thank you very much. I will try to accelerate a little my presentation. Okay, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Rafael Barrio for the invitations. At first, it seemed a little weird for me because I'm a social scientist, and I suppose this should be a maiden on physics, but my college convinced me about the interdisciplinary nature of this symposium, it's a fact. And they have been here all these three days to talk, talking about uh, dynamics and complexity of system. So I accepted the invitation because scientific activity is also a complex system and science has been one of my obsessions since I was a child. In fact, I was fascinated by three things during my childhood, science, maps, and libraries. Uh, libraries came first. Since I can't remember, I remember reading. My favorite places were always the libraries of all my schools. And year by year, I was turning my house in Cuba into a huge library with a lot of books. The second was science. I remember the first time that I saw the, the TV show Cosmos presented by Carl Sagan. That was a relevant moment of my adolescence. That's when I knew that science would impact my life in, in many ways. And finally, maps. Uh, I love atlases and geography books. And the idea of measuring and mapping was always a challenge for me. And this challenge was so extreme that the first career I studied was geodesy and cartography. And my first job was literally making maps in the Photogrammetric Institute of Havana. One day, uh, the universe decided to align all my hobbits. Uh, and I looking for a job in the library. I started a career as a librarian. Uh, I got my PhD in Scientometrics. Scientometrics is a branch of library and information science, specialized on quantitative studies of science and technology. And to my surprise, some of the techniques that I used in my doctoral thesis were mapping techniques. But in this case, in this case, not to make geographic maps, but maps to visualize the structure of scientific knowledge. So I am here today to talk about some of my experience. Uh, working with uh, modeling and, and mapping scientific uh, knowledge networks and how these maps can be used to, to analyze uh, scientific organizations. I will start with a very simple question. What happened in this world to make it possible for, li for a librarian like me to participate in a symposium like this? First, a revolution in data. Right now we are living the fourth industrial revolution, all human activities are undergoing a radical transformation characterized by the automation of processes, the digitalization of the information generated by these processes, and the accumulation of large amounts of data that scientists must be able to analyze in order to discover new knowledge. Secondly, the paradigm of complexity and the transdisciplinary nature of problems facing scientists today. Regardless of the context or specialty, the probability to find solutions to the great problems of modern society is very high if we work with a specialist from different, uh, different areas. Uh, and this is very important when we deal with transdisciplinary problems because uh, uh, multidisciplinary groups are capable of addressing problems with different perspectives, with a more holistic and multidimensional vision. And this, um, uh, this symposium is an example of that. 
And thirdly, the emergence of a new um, new field of transdisciplinary research. In this new field, all of us, physicists, biologists, uh, computer scientists, mathematicians, sociologists, librarians, all of us have become data analysts. And the challenge is to analyze science as a complex system. The challenge is to analyze science as a wonderful scenario where institutions, people, ideas, and norms suddenly form networks. And these networks uh, are strongly interconnected to constantly generate new knowledge with the aim to understand and transform our reality. The name of this new transdisciplinary field or transdisciplinary approach is Science of Science, and is led by relevant researchers such as Laszlo Barabasi, one of the pioneers in network analysis, Dan Shun Wan, and many others. Uh, in reality, neither the idea nor the term is new. The term was used in the first half of Santo Fortunato, of course, is, is one of the, is one of the leaders that work with, with Timo. In reality, neither the idea uh, nor the term is new. The term was used in the first half of the 20th century and uh, tried to understand how scientists organize themselves, how they collaborate with each other, how their performance is, uh, how much the how much relationship the impact of what they do has on the development of the society where they live. All of these are all problems, uh, all objectives of sociologists, philosophers, economists, scientometricians, as you can see in this slide, is what is called meta sciences. However, how this new uh, field of science of science emerged, we have to go, uh, we have to go back to a relevant contribution of a North American chemist named Eugene Garfield, who developed one of the most important databases of all time, the Science Citation Index. I'm sure that all of you know this databases by the way we are evaluated. I'm sure that all of you know the journal impact factor, the age index, uh, quartile one journals, and all these indicators that usually are used in our research evaluation exercises. However, in its origin, Garfield developed the Science Citation Index as a tool to retrieve information using the bibliographic references that scientists use in their paper. And this cognitive connection between science that was made in the past and science that is done at present is what led him to build probably the first visual representation of scientific knowledge networks. And this is one of the first uh, networks created by, by Garfield in the Institute of, uh, for Scientific Information of Philadelphia. So, of course, this evolved dramatically during the next decades. The, the storage capacity of computers grew as well as the speed of computing, the uh, volume of literature, uh, of scientific literature grew exponentially with the emergence of internet and the World Wide Web. New databases were developed such as Scopus, Google Scholar, Dimensions, uh, Data Banks, uh, PubMed, and, and new visualization uh, methodologies and software were also created. And even some dreams of the pioneers of the artificial intelligence also come true. And ChatGPT is the, the best example of our days. Uh, we have been talking about this uh, tool a lot during this important. And what do scientists dedicated to science of science do? I will try to show you with three interesting examples developed in, in recent years. For example, uh, three years ago, uh, Laszlo Barabasi, one of the main researchers in this field, uh, presented an interesting work that studied the real relationship between your age and your sense of success. So, science of science here uh, was used to to analyze um, the was used as, as a as a method to analyze the. the let me show you. Let me show you. Right. 
Dennis. The hidden mechanism that drives success, no matter, no matter your field of knowledge. There are two important categories that Barabasi work with, success and performance. Uh, to be successful, you must ha first have performance. You must do good research, publish it in good academic journals, and receive some citations by this paper. But success, uh, success um, depends on many factors. The quality of research, of course, the social, uh, its social impact, uh, the scope or visibility of the journal where this uh, research is published, the dominant paradigm of science at the moment when this paper is published, and of course the creativity of the researchers. If we observe the moment in which uh, the great geniuses of sciences uh, made, their, made their main contributions, we would conclude, like Einstein, that only before 30 can only be one uh, truly creative. Uh, but not, of, not all of us are geniuses, and most of scientists contribute to the, uh, to the growth of science in small steps. And Barabasi and his colleagues decided to analyze the whole career of every single scientist. And what did he observe in data? Well, he discovered that success could come at any time. It could be your very first or your very last paper of your career. Creativity has no age. The probability of finding uh, or having successful paper at the end of our career only is, uh, is low just because our productivity decreases. As long as we stay productive, active and productive in the field, we will have a chance to, to have a successful paper. And this is amazing. This is a very good news for those who love science and stay active and productive. So I have to congratulate everybody here in this room because we, we still have time to achieve our best scientific results. We still have time to, uh, as Rafa said, uh, we still have time to find the horse. <laughs> a second, another interesting uh, example was developed by a research team led by Kasi Sugimoto and Vincent Larripier. Kasi Sugimoto is right now the president of the International Society of Scientometrics and Informatics. And they were focused on a relevant uh, topic right now, gender disparities in science. Uh, many reports have identified this problem. There are more um, female than male in, in undergraduate and graduate students in, in many countries, however, a lot of authors uh, have reported um, low numbers of female full professor as well as gender uh, inequalities in hiring, in earning, in funding, in satisfaction, patenting, and even in scientific productivity. Uh, but these have been generally focused by anecdotal reports um, or highly localized and monodisciplinary uh, studies. So Tsuchimoto and her team decided to analyze more than uh, 5 million of papers developed by more than 27 million of authors in a period of five years. Of course, uh, uh, she used the, the web of science data. And they analyzed three aspects, output, collaboration, and impact. And the panorama they observed was worrisome. Let me show you. For example, men dominated scientific production in nearly every country. Women account for fewer than 30% of, of fractionalized authorship, and female authorship only uh, was more prevalent in countries with lower scientific output. As a first author, women were also underrepresented. And for every article with a female first author, um, there were nearly two articles per author by men. Specialties uh, clearly dominated by women include nursing, midwifery, speech, language and hearing, education, social work, librarianship, and only a few social sciences. Men clearly dominated military sciences, engineering, robotics, astronautics, aeronautics, uh, high energy physics, 
mathematics, computer science, uh, philosophy, economics, and even the humanities are heavily dominated by men. For the 50 most productive uh, countries in the study, accounting for 97% of the total publications, female collaboration are more domestically oriented than collaboration of males from the same country. This is, uh, women were more involved in, in, in national collaboration than in international collaboration, which is, uh, and, and what about the impact? Well, they analyzed prominent authors' uh, position, for example, first author um, and last author. And when a woman was in any of these roles, the paper attracted fewer citations, and this is dramatic. If we consider that citations are uh, plays a central role in our research evaluation exercise, probably the most, the only good news in this study was that South America was among the region with the highest gender parity in science, which was surprising, at least, at least for me. Uh, I am sure that in this behavior it is uh, influenced a lot uh, uh, countries uh, such as Brazil and Argentina. It's not the same behavior in the rest of the Latin American countries. Anyway, the scale of this study tells us that there are too much uh, work to do in order to solve uh, gender disparities in science. And this is not a political discourse. If this is what data tells us. Finally, the last example was developed in our complexity science center. Here at UNAM for three years, Dr. Humberto Carrillo and I have coordinated uh, an academic program, uh, Scientometrics, Complexity, and Science of Science, and in which we are trying to, to create different methods and, and visualization techniques to analyze the, the characteristic of Mexican science. Particularly in this study, some of the speakers of this symposium have participated. Uh, and we use one of the artificial intelligence techniques that Dr. Jose Luis Jimenez uh, will show you in the last presentation of this symposium. What do we want to see at work? Well, we start from the analysis of an on-writing development policy of the UNAM. Uh, generally, our institutions begin as laboratories, which then reach a certain degree of development and become research centers, and um, then follow this development and become institutes. A lot, of, a lot of transformation um, can be observed in, in the whole processes. And in, as in previous examples, we can uh, identify this uh, transformation from the analysis of published papers. So our question here was, how can organizational um, and leadership changes um, can affect our research performance? That's, that's our question. For first, we selected one institution belonging to our university, the Renewable Energy Institute. This organization was first a lab, then later a center, and finally an institute with some change of leadership during the process. Then we analyzed six variables using a battery of bibliometric indicators. We decided to, to observe productivity, co-authorship, international collaboration, multidisciplinarity, and the number of um, research teams and research fronts from the foundation of the Institute to the 2021. However, each of these indicators in, in isolation did not tell us much about the dynamics of the organizational behavior. So we decided to analyze them from a multidimensional perspective. First, we use a well-known multivariate techniques with the help of our dear CIPE, principal component analysis. Uh, analyzing all these indicators as a whole and comparing them year by year, the annual distribution was divided into three main groups. And these groups correspond to the three structural stages of the Institute. Therefore, we confirm the structural um, transformation, that the structural transformation had a, an impact in, in the institutional scientific performance. Then we use an artificial neural network and obtained these self-organizing maps with the help of Dr. Jose Luis Jimenez. 
And in them, we could clearly see that changes in performance were not only seen in changes in structure, but also in change in leadership. Here, the change in structure is the red line in the trajectory and change in, in, in leadership can be observed by the color of the years. The color uh, of the years change uh, when a new director of the institution is in, incorporated. In each of the period of leadership, <clears throat> there were, uh, of course, uh, a certain social context. There was uh, a policy that governed the, the, the way of doing science at this moment. And this was expressed in our battery of indicators. Uh, there were stages in which international collaboration was stimulated and the number of um, in, um, papers authored by, with international authors grew. And there were stages where um, the center was open to new thematic areas and the uh, thematic dispersity grew. Exactly. Also, in these cases, productivity, co-authorship, international collaboration, the number of research group, thematic dispersion index is, is, a, is a, an indicator created by our team, and uh, the the bibliographic coupling groups is the the the, the group for the the the, amount, the group of papers um, related by the similarity of the bibliographic references they have in common. So, the, um, in a general sense, uh, all organizational stages were reflected in some way in the scientific performance of the institution. Each change gave way to a new stage of development where milestones were reached in some of the um, variables analyze it. The policies developed by the leaders of the organization in each period of management had an effect in a short or medium team, uh, term in some of these indicators. And the most important change made during the last stage, which involved the transformation of a vertical um, a structure focused on, on departments into a horizontal structure focused on projects, well, resulted in an increase in institutional collaboration, a growth in multidisciplinarity, and it was the period with the best performance uh, of, in the history of the of the center. You can see this in the last in the last uh, stage of the institute. What the the performance is so all the indicators have to pay their best uh, values. The next step was to analyze that behavior with a dynamic model, and that it, it were, uh, were the were, when the host of this. Uh, symposium uh, came into play, uh, Dr. Rafael Barrio. We tried to answer different questions related to productivity, collaboration, multidisciplinarity in a recent, um, recently published paper. Uh, we finally modeled this behavior and demonstrate the impact of institutional organization on research productivity and multidisciplinarity. Of course, these are only uh, three examples, four examples of uh, a lot of research on the development, but I think time is over and I have to finish and I don't want to end without show you some of the science of science questions that our research pipeline in our academic problem at C3 is analyzing right now. For example, these are my new obsessions in 2023. These concerns are shared with the rest of my research team. We are very focused on the determinants of productivity and collaboration. We are very focused on the determinants of multi inter and transdisciplinary research. We are very focused also in analyzing the impact, the impact of research on, on sustainable development. And the, uh, Dr. Julieta Wenya presented an interesting paper yesterday about this. And we are looking for new indicators to measure all these, values, all these variables. So the answer to all these questions is the reason I, I came to Mexico in 2020. The, the answer to all these questions is the reason why I am here today. Uh, grateful to live in this beautiful country. Grateful to, to work at this great university. Grateful to, to have been participating in this symposium. And of course, thanking all of you for your attention during my presentation. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Ricardo. That was most interesting. Um, set of studies. You, you. So let's have uh, some questions, comments. Over there, yes. Okay. So I, I have a question about, uh, for example, intelligence tests, IQ tests, are known to be culturally biased. So in this case, like the work of the science of success is based on some definition of success. I think you are in a uh, top tier university, Harvard, or something like that. Is that true? I mean, can, can is there some cultural bias in this type of studies? I mean, that's what you're when you try to apply them like in Mexico. <laughs> Probably we have to to check this. Uh, uh, the the methodology they use was to. Uh, to analyze the first paper published by this by a researcher and the last paper, so uh, I'm sure that this will have some dif uh, difference with when we analyze a, a global uh, a scenario, or if you analyze a, a particularly local this a scenario. I'm sure that Mexico have maybe have the same behavior. I don't know. Uh, probably we have to. To replicate this study, uh, only specifically uh, working with, Me with Mexican actor is a is a research to do. About this worry about uh, gender differences in science. Uh, I mean, if we look for the biological point of view, of course there should be differences. We have different brains, they say. But from the social point of view, there shouldn't be any differences. So it would be very interesting to disentangle the whole thing by looking at patient careers and not at the numbers, but at the derivatives, right? So as as a society becomes more open to uh, equality, gender equality, you should see the derivative going at, at the same pace. And in that case, then you could blame the society organization for this difference. But on the other hand, if you don't find that, that means that there's truly a difference. So there's nothing wrong about it. Yeah. The misconception about gender equality is that we should do exactly the same in every field. And I don't think that is true. And it would be very interesting if we look at uh, that thing in the chair. Exactly. But uh, as, as I said before, so we have probably the same uh, number of female and, and, and males in, in undergraded and graded problems. The, um, so the probability to, to, to have the same parity when we analyze uh, scientific results of papers, well, we, we can expect the same, but this is the reality. <laughs> Only a few countries have more female authors than male authors. So in research, in, 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 in research results, uh, particularly papers, the world is blue. It's dominated by men. And there is no <laughs> doubt about this. So we have analyzed uh, this, uh, of course. Like I, 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 and, and you point, uh, your point is very good because we can analyze this from different, uh, analyzing different disciplines. Because uh, the, the, in in different in in some disciplines, this behavior is different, and we can't analyze this. We must analyze this in with more perf uh, more focus in 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 details. No, this is a global view, but we must focus on details. As you can actually recommend, Umberto. Yeah, uh, I agree with Rafa that the, the rate of change is is relevant. And probably the, the most important thing to look at. Uh, to study gender uh, differences from, uh, uh, particularly in Mexico, ha has been one of the main objectives of our, our group. Uh, actually, we did uh, a study about uh, studying uh, uh, 48,000 students of our university. And, and we observe how their performance uh, evolved. 
uh, in our university uh, in, in the 50s of uh, the last century, uh, mo most uh, students were, were men and uh, a low proportion of women. And this was changing, 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 and now we have more women than men. And uh, doing, doing uh, data analysis and using information not only about the performance, uh, the academic performance, but also on the uh, uh, economical level of the family. And, uh, and any, an interesting indicator was whether the mother of the student had uh, a university degree or not. And something that happened is that the data shows that, of course, that this, this is a, a, a strong factor that influences the student performance. But the data that we uh, analyze uh, uh, show that the effect on the woman, on the, on the daughters, is stronger than the effect on the men. So that's that's is is now pointing to a, a new research. We have to go deeper on yes. that because it would imply that that the dis disproportion of women and men in the university is going to be growing. <laughs> yes. Sir. Let me let me also ask uh, about this uh, gender disparities. Uh, you showed a graph where you were looking at uh, uh, first authorships. Um, but then uh, in some sciences, like in the medical sciences, uh, they pay a lot of attention to the, uh, to the corresponding, corresponding authorship. Mm -hmm. And usually it is the last, last one showing uh, kind of seniority or those uh, kind of idea given or, or, uh, or, uh, the one who got the money to do the research mm -hmm. and uh, the it would be interesting to look at uh, from the corresponding authorship especially especially in the field of uh, medical sciences yes and also biological sciences perhaps because yes. there it really matters i mean people when they start writing a paper i've, I've been in many of these occasions then then it's a uh, one of the first issues which come come into in the in the discussion who is going to be the corresponding author exactly as in our team <laughs> yeah but in the, in this case in medical science and biological science there is a parity in gender parity in the yeah. specialties yes. okay see you again um very nice so uh, of this, uh, uh, well, first, a uh, very good optimistic uh, outlook for not problems with age, but they can still be very creative. Of, of course. <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, but when we look at this, uh, I don't know if it's very global, no? so, I mean, to all the sciences, there's no discrimination of age, and when you analyze the productivity or the output, etc. But I think perhaps in the cases around the women, for example, one thing which is very important to surely affect the career of both women when they have children. Maternity, of course. So that, that's something that's which possibly delays some of the productivity of the women uh, until the children are being taken care of or when the grow or hit, etc. Well, uh, we have to check the paper. I, 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 I think that the productivity is slow, and probably the, the most uh, relevant career in in that country is not science, uh, or, or there is no money for science, and I don't know. 
I think uh, he, uh, Cassidy put some of this uh, explanation in the, in the presentation. I, this is the link you, you can access to this conference. And it's a very interesting conference. And, and, and she goes in details with this kind of uh, explanation. But it's because the low productivity of the country. So the, in, 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 in low num when, we, when you have low numbers, it's more probability to find this kind of uh, exceptions, no? <laughs> yeah, but this I, is a very interesting point. I think we have to stop here. Because, oh, yes. uh, otherwise, we missed the coffee break. So let's give a hand to all the speakers and especially Richard. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, okay, let's start. Uh, I was already uh, reprimanded uh, by two persons uh, being late, so um, I apologize uh, the audience and everyone, all the presenters uh, as well. Uh, our next uh, presentation is by, I mean, it's a keynote presentation by Cecilia Ventura. And I should say that uh, towards our last discussion about uh, gender disparity, at least among uh, the keynote uh, speakers, there is a great disparity in favor of ah. women <laughs> this time. So I wanted to make a point of that, indeed. Okay, uh, about Cecilia. Uh, 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 she's... Uh, uh, currently a researcher at the uh, Academy, uh, Argentinian National Research Council, based on uh, um, Central, Central Atomic for Bariloche, uh, in Bariloche, Argentina, as well as a full professor at uh, UNRN, University, uh, National University of Rio Negro, since 2009. She represents varying lots of physicists at the uh, Argentinian uh, Physics Association and at the UNRN professor at the local research council of the, of the university. Uh, looking at uh, her background, I mean, uh, she has been doing really honest to God uh, 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 condensed matter physics and continues to do among other other things, uh, I have this story uh, uh, from Oxford uh, uh, from my uh, gang member, Icelander gang member, who went to the uh, buy fish, uh, fresh fish from the local fishmonger, and he wanted to buy a cod, and they went there and then uh, was offered fish. And uh, then Gudmundur uh, 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 said that uh, this is not caught. Then uh, the fishmonger asked, uh, uh, how do you know? He said that I'm, a, I'm an Icelander. I know fish. <laughs> so then the fishmonger said, uh, this is sort of caught. So perhaps we all the rest have been doing sort of physics, but Cecilia is doing <laughs> Real physics. Okay, the title of the talk is uh, Non-Conventional Superconductors Describing the Electronic Properties of uh, Fe and Fire Fi and Bisworth based ones. <laughs> based, based, based ones. Okay, please. Okay, thank you very much, Kimo. And uh, well, first of all, I would like to say it's a pleasure to be back in Mexico and I'm very grateful to the organizer in particular my old friend already now, Professor Barrio, for being here again and, and having the opportunity to continue our collaboration and, and, and present a bit of our work. Uh, well, with the work, most recent work we've been doing uh, together is during the pandemics, I, I helped a bit with the work in the, in the modeling of the pandemic and in particular the vaccination distribution um, modelization, etc. So that's where I started with this new work. But that going a bit back in history, let me see what this. Uh, here 
uh, very briefly, as many of the speakers mentioned, the connection, the original first connection with Rafael. I, when I was a PhD student in Bariloche in 92, he came and spent two months in Bariloche with Lee and he gave a, a green function course in condensed matter. I was one of the students. Yeah. So that was my first uh, connection with Rafael as a student during my PhD. And then here I put some, I think I forgot some of the, of the papers we published together, but here there are some of the things and you will see that, of course, at that time, Rafael was more centered also in condensed matter, but he was already, uh, let's say, going to use nonlinear physics in, in all the kind of things we've been listening in this conference. No? It's really a very broad, uh, a spectrum of, uh, of uh, let's say, uh, issues and subjects of his research. And that's why he has also always a very nice insight in everything. No? So he gives very, and he's also very fun to work with. So that's one other thing. So one of the first things we did after meeting in Oxford in 94, etc., we took some time and then we looked at some work uh, in, in solids, in disordered solids, and some analytical approximations to treat disordered solids for the electronic structure. And then we looked at uh, some work with other colleagues, uh, Javier Fur, and then with my student, uh, Jose Querales, let me see where was the point right here. Uh, Jose Querales Flores, he came from, I think it's not, uh, Querales Flores, he, he came later to do his PhD and his master's before with me, and now he's in Ireland. Um, and there we, we worked with, Rafael had been doing, 10 years before the, our works, studying amorphous uh, solids, where uh, you had germanium uh, basis and tin uh, defect. And they found that there was some kind of interesting defect, which was not really uh, looked much more later, but we looked at this in alloys, which were prepared and which had interest for um, spatial industry. So they used these kind of things uh, uh, for, Opti optomechanical filters, etc., uh, optoelectronic filters. Uh, so what we did was look at these defects in detail, uh, made a statistical model for the formation of the alloy, including them. Uh, here for the physical review B, we had to convince the referees that they were relevant <laughs> defects. They said, but no, all tin goes uh, uh, <laughs> substitutionally. And we showed, no, there are reasons above a certain limiting concentration, they should enter in this kind of uh, defect where the tin occupies a die vacancy of Germania. And actually then later a group in, in Belgium found the defect. So they published it and said, well, these defects we really found them. And so the referees must have been happy. And we, we had predicted the thing and, and it was real. And uh, well, then we looked at also this kind of um, uh, ternary alloys, which uh, this was actually motivated by some uh, proposal when, when he saw our works, Pepe Menendez, Jose Menendez is an Argentinian working in Arizona. Um, and they, they work very much in this kind of uh, alloys. And he was interested in, in having uh, ideas of the gaps when they have the ternary alloy. So actually one of the approximations we used here, an analytic approximation, um, we used it to analyze the gap depending on the concentrations. And that seems to be a paper which they, they are quite happy using it for, uh, let's say, for research. And then um, we looked at this other um, gap to uh, continue looking at this kind of effect. And this is the latest thing we, which Tipe uh, was presenting today, and, and Jan mentioned also, where we are started working together in epidemiology, epi epidemics for the pandemics, the COVID pandemic, right? So. Uh, this, we got These are just a few pictures, very old ones. <laughs> and this is Rafael when he visited, uh, he visited Bariloche many times. And this is Villangostura. Uh, this is a lake. Oh, sorry. That's uh, very quickly. Uh, this is a lake nearby in Villa Langostura, And that's my husband, uh, well, 2006. And my eldest son, who's now 19, here that was two years old. And this one of the visits, that's we meeting together in 2008 when Rafael and Lee, I think, were spending a sabbatical in Oxford, and we were there near theoretical physics. Uh, this is in 2018 where we organized the, the symposium for in Latin American uh, uh, physics and solid state in Bariloche. And uh, well, there you see Rafael. We're having tea after the uh, symposium finished. <laughs> 
And those are, uh, this is a, well, a friend of mine who is a physicist in solid state matter from Buenos Aires. This is the pointer. Horacio Pastaski from Córdoba, yes. He was actually also one of my teachers when I started in condensed matter. And this is a colleague of mine who started in Buenos Aires. And in, in the old times, when I did my PhD, in my master's thesis, I, I worked in nuclear physics, nuclear structure theory. Then I changed to condensed matter. And then this is, this is one taken this week when we were having lunch. We should take more pictures of this week because this is the, the only one I, I had around to show. And so well, now let's go back to, I was thinking a bit what I would be talking about because since the latest collaboration were already taken care of. So I said, well, I'll talk about something which I will, I will surprise with Rafael because he's not included here. I mean, we've done a lot of work together, but he's not included in this. So I said, so he will not be bored at least. And uh, he, uh, there are some people here he knows, well, my student, Jose Querales. Let me see, there's a pointer there. Uh, Roberta Chitrus is from Italy, Salerno. R Jose Rodriguez Nunez is from Venezuela, also an old uh, time collaborator. And these two are, are uh, two physicists, also ladies. So uh, the gender, I mean, if you look at here, actually it's uh, two men and four women in the group. <laughs> so, um, and well, this is a younger student. Uh, she's now already did the postdoc, et cetera, from Gladys, who's a professor, experimental physics professor in Mariloche. And uh, you possibly know, she was uh, in Paco de la Cruz's group. And well, she still is there in a lab of low temperature physics. So with different people here, we, we did a bit of a study of these things. So I wanted just to mention, and what does it have to do with this conference, perhaps? Well, for once, I thought it would be interesting. But also, even here, I also our work, I mean, my theoretical work, is always trying to look at complex systems and trying to get some kind of simple model which captures the main ingredients, or at least we, so we hope those are the main ingredients. And if we can fit the results, the experiments, or predict things, we are happy because we were able to capture the main ingredients. So in terms, these also are systems where one has a lot of complexity, but one tries to isolate what one thinks are main ingredients and do a simple model to try to describe them. That's what I wanted to, to tell you a bit about. So. Uh, so very briefly, I will not go into detail and all, but in principle, I will just be talking about in general what is non-conventional superconductors uh, is the name we are using now for the ones which don't have as the attraction between electrons, which produces superconductivity of the material, uh, not mediated by phonons. So the, the, the systems, which are now a lot, in which one ca can exclude phonon interaction between the electrons to be the main uh, mechanism for superconductivity. And these families of I'm going to talk about are families where by the different experiments, et cetera, it was excluded that phonons would be the main source of superconductivity. And since the simplicities are very complex, what we did was also center in the normal state. If you also have to understand the normal state to see later, there's a lot of discussion. It's still the superconducting phase is still in the, the discussion and the exact nature of the gap and all the mechanisms. But what this uh, thought of is that really phonons are not playing a role there. But for example, correlation between electrons, yes. So electronic uh, co correlation. And exactly that's one of the things uh, we want to, to focus on in these materials. What is the important correlations and how can we include it in a simple model? And actually we look at different pro properties with a simple model including correlations and look at spectral properties, Fermi surface topology, uh, also transport, magnetotransport. And with a simple model, we could fit a lot of experimental results. So we thought, I mean, there are, let me just go into the next, okay. Just because uh, the audience is very broad, just to center a bit of what we're talking about. This is an interesting picture of uh, on a review of superconductors done in 2015 you know, uh, by these people, by uh, Jorge Hirsch, Brian Maple, and Frank Marsilio. Uh, and they uh, put classified the superconducting materials in 32 classes, the, the, uh, not by using machine learning. So this is the old kind of classification. Um, and then here they put, uh, uh, let's say, the critical temperature and the year where they were discovered. 
And so the ones I'm going to talk about were discovered, the iron-based ones in 2008. Uh, and the temperatures are about, uh, about 50 Kelvin degrees, the maximum critical temperatures. And the ones I'm talking later, uh, the bismuth-based ones, um, these were discovered in 2012, and they have about 10 degrees for the critical temperature. So there, that's a bit to, to locate a bit where we are talking. And on the other, here you see the preview, the first uh, superconductors are in this region, well, the ones which were previous to BCS theory, for example. So let's go to the, well, uh, when these uh, iron-based uh, superconductors appeared, there was a big uh, surprise in everybody, you know, because even the, the first uh, laminar uh, superconductors based on copper, copper oxide planes, the cuprates, were already in 1986 quite a surprise because everybody thought that everything in superconductivity was understood with the old low TC superconductors uh, with conductivity mediated by forward. Well, the cuprates let's say, opened a new, let's say, area of uh, research. So, uh, phonos were uh, thought they could not explain the results and a lot of mechanisms were investigated and are still investigated. But uh, in some sense, copper has spins. Spins uh, traditionally are uh, opponents of superconductivity. Well, so imagine when this appeared, we'd be even stronger spins. You have iron. But the thing is, of course, is the, the iron uh, there is in certain planes and the interaction between the electronic interaction between them actually turn, uh, let's say, give a result of low uh, interaction between the electrodes. So, I mean, intermediate value. So it's not strong correlations, you know, intermediate. And there are experimental uh, evidence for that. No? So, well, actually, this was a bit uh, what I was saying. And they say the, old, the other thing is, of course, that these new uh, materials with uh, layers where iron was present and related to superconductivity appeared, proved that the phenomenon, of, let's say, of superconductivity is not limited to a single class of compounds, not only the cuprates were the ones, uh, let's say, uh, you say in Spanish, pateando el tablero, <laughs> of the, the traditional superconductivity. No? So we have to think of new things. Um, and they say, well, uh, some of the things that the iron compounds indicate that they possibly are unconventional superconductors is because, for example, the phase that I'm, I'm going to show you, it's quite complex. Superconductivity emerges out of a bad metal normal state. So, uh, even the normal state is interesting. It's not the traditional metal which you had in the old uh, superconductors. And also superconducting phase occurs near the onset of the antiferromagnetic order. So one would imagine that perhaps magnetism has a role in that. No? That's all the theories for how do you mediate the superconductivity. Um, well, there are very interesting uh, reviews, and of course, there was a lot of publications in that time, and for the continue. Yes, just a, a review in 2012, so four years after they were discovered, and they already had all these families of iron-based uh, superconductors uh, 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 found, and basically all of these had these uh, planes where the red uh, ions are the irons, and the yellow ones depend a bit on the material. For example, the more simpler ones are the ones we are called iron calcogenides, where the yellow things are, for example, selenide, uh, can be also sulfur or um, telluride. Uh, but then the others are basically called the nictites, where you have not only iron, but these yellow things are basically mostly uh, arsenic. Sometimes it's not only arsenic, they change arsenic with, for example, phosphorus or other things. But basically, all of them have these kind of uh, planes with these uh, things. And de depending on the materials, the structures can be more complicated, but they still have this kind of plane. And those are the things which are, from the experiments, notice that those iron planes are the ones relevant for superconductivity and the ones we want to understand. Here, there's a, uh, just a, a few, so, so I was mentioning that these kind of materials have temperature around 50 degrees, some are a bit late, uh, smaller, etc. Uh, this is the other kind of superconductors I was telling you, discovered in 2012. And this is also from a review more recent, this is 2019. And again, here you notice a lot of families, or sorry, um, a lot of families were discovered 
uh, having this low temperatures for conductivity, this is one of the most studied ones, uh, which has this kind of structure. Uh, and it, for example, has this 11.5 Kelvin degrees. Uh, and, and depending on the temperature, they have the pressure, they have different values. And this case, they have also planes. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, well, let me see if I can take it out here. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, basically, in these materials, the relevant planes with the orbitals, which are related, uh, thought to be mediating superconductivity and all the interesting properties, have to do with uh, what is called bismuth S2. So, for example, so you have bismuth with the two uh, sulfurs coordinate, coordinating. Uh, and then you have, well, basically it's these planes, and, and, and you have them in all of them. So, I mean, in the, if you look in detail, you will find those kind of planes everywhere. And so those are the important planes which one has to look at um, when you want to model it. No? So basically, this was the abstract I presented for this um, uh, talk. And uh, well, as, as you see there, I, I was saying that in these compounds, uh, what is common to them is that they really have phase diagrams, which are, uh, they, they involve complex coupled uh, orderings of charge, orbital, and spin, as you will now see, which they make difficult their experimental study also due to the correlations which are present between the different relevant degrees of freedom. But also from experiments, these correlations uh, could be, um, let's say, assessed in some sense. Or, so they're believed at the moment to be intermediate in both of these kind of families of compounds. The crystal structure is similar of the layers to that in the cuprates, but they have differences with the cuprates. These are, in, let's say, the normal state is a bad metal. Instead, there you, you have a, a, a nice, a, how do you call it? A, it's a non-metal, right, in, in the other materials. It's a, and so, um, these are also characterized as multi-band superconductors. So it's not just one band which is relevant near the Fermi level. There are more orbitals. And you can see in different experiments that this thing is important. Um, so what we did was, uh, no, 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 they, they, they have, no. no, they don't have that, okay. No, that's why you have to think of the different things. So we, we tried to, with all what was known, try to do some simple model and see if we, with that simple model, we could, uh, unfortunately, we could explain uh, quite a few things. So um, we proposed then a simplified microscopic model to describe the families, which in principle are very similar. Uh, and we will we analyze, analyze them with an analytical treatment because these correlations were intermediate. So we could do perturbation uh, in the green function uh, sets of equations. Um, and then we use that to focus on the normal state and looked at all of these things as I was mentioning, Fermi surface topology and its changes with concentration, with temperature, etc. cetera, uh, spectral properties, uh, transport, magnetotransport, uh, and we could also do predictions and describe, uh, describe uh, better the things if we included intermediate correlation. So here's just a flavor of the kind of phase diagrams one is dealing with. And then, and you see, um, uh, depending on, these are the iron materials, yeah, iron-based ones. And here you see, depending on the doping and the temperature, you have magnetic order. In this case, you have superconductivity uh, in the tetragonal phase. Here, these are crystal and different orthorhombic phase. Then they have paramagnetism in the tetragonal phase also. And you have different transitions, which you can have there. And also another one, uh, you have uh, also iron and arsenic here, uh, but ordered differently, coordinate differently. And you have then the superconducting phase, which in some sense coexists with this uh, other phase. Um, this is the kind of uh, ordering they, they, they have. Uh, it's uh, some kind of uh, uh, ordering. Uh, Uh, well, I, I'm not sure. Really. We did not uh, look at that. Perhaps it's uh, no, perhaps they are excluded. Yes, could be. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, yes, actually, we we focus on the paramagnetic normal phase and and, and the changes of that with uh, with temperature and doping. Uh, so this is just to give you a flavor, but the thing the problem is complicated. We chose to, to work in one part, and um, here is if you want to look at what is known, let's say from from uh, DFT calculations. Uh, when you look at the near Fermi level, the, the principal things which dominate are the iron 3D levels. No? If you look, this is a total density of state. And uh, arsenic, for example, is uh, very low, has some uh, dense, uh, weight there. But the principal orbital weight is for uh, 3D. And even when they look in detail how the 5D, 3D orbitals in, uh, in, are involved, it's basically the ones which are uh, with more density, orbital uh, spectral density near the Fermi level are basically a two. So that's actually what we use where you have other things. We will not look at that in too detail, but that's in some sense what we decided to use as a starting point for our model. Basically this model by Ragu who proposed that a simple model, a tight binding model for the, um, kinetic energy part uh, with uh, uh, two degenerate iron orbitals per sites with this kind of, uh, of 3D levels. And uh, well, using that thing, you can get two effective bands in uh, the Fermi level. And these uh, actually are quite good. So we're doing something which is a model for these iron arsenic planes, but it also is useful for the iron selenide, for the calcogenides. And we will see that you can adapt it also to the bismuth based materials, also with two effective uh, orbitals for the kinetic energy part. So this would be how the effective orbitals look. If you look at, the, at this thing with uh, one iron per cell or, or the, you visualize this with two uh, irons per cell, and basically you see the, the Fermi surface is composed of whole pockets, the red ones, and electron pockets. And depending on the doping, this change. Some grow, some... Uh, so there are also Fermi surface topology changes. And well, here's just a um, discussion where, of course, there, there are paired models, not only with two orbitals, with all these people were looking at different things with two orbitals. People looked at three orbitals, four orbitals, and even five. So you can... <laughs> but I mean, with the two orbital models, one can explain a lot of things. So for some details, yes. For example, the spin orbital in, in some of the materials, if you want to look in detail, spin orbit interaction can be interesting. And then they say, well, then you have to take a third orbital into account, et cetera, to improve that. But for we, we do it a bit in general. We're not looking at a precise material. We are doing it very general. And with that quite general thing, we could uh, explain a lot of things. If you want for a precise material, you can adapt the model and, and include what you need. So basically what I'm showing is this what it says in the yellow part below, a minimal two orbital model, uh, which the community accepted as quite adequate for many of the low energy physics uh, properties of ferronickel. So there is experimental evidence for the correlations not being too high. We're going to jump this. Uh, from theoretical studies also, intermediate correlations are the ones which are thought to be present between these effective orbitals. And so uh, basically what we did was propose a minimal model taking all that into account. And uh, here, I'm just before showing the model, uh, we decided to choose to wor work on the normal state properties with that minimal microscopic model, with including two correlated effective orbitals, where as a correlation, we added local Intra electron correlation type or, or Hubble type and an inter orbital electron correlation. Adding that to these or kinetic energy to effective uh, orbitals by Rahu. Mm -hmm. And then we did a perturbative analytical approach in the correlations uh, to determine the temperature dependent electron Green's function. Uh, and with that, we could, depending on the, of course, we could get the hard tree fog solution which for some properties was useful. So we will see that for some of the transport use uh, properties, we did not need to use our full uh, solution in second order. But for example, if we wanted to explain the spectral density details, um, well, uh, along certain paths of the brilliant zone, we needed to have more detail in the self-energy. 
And then our self-energy includes explicit dependence on temperature, doping, and crystal momentum. So we could really uh, approach some things which are interesting to look at. And well, this is one of the papers which we published um, with that. So as I said, the model is basically what we are saying, taking these two uh, orbitals, adding the correlations on-site uh, or inter-orbital correlations. Uh, small n is one of the orbitals, large n is the number of the others. Here they are. Uh, and actually, before we go to some other, we can do, taking these uh, orbitals, as I showed before, you can describe the iron-based superconductor. And what we did was, there is a Japanese group who also found some kind of good starting point for the kinetic energy, taking two effective orbitals for the bismuth based superconductor. So this same model, changing the starting two uh, orbitals, we used it to describe the, the two families of materials. And here, for example, just to mention, uh, because uh, in the audience, perhaps you're not working exactly with these things. Uh, what are we talking about when we say the spectral density function? We calculate the green function for the propagation of one electron along the material. And then from the imaginary part, we obtain uh, the contribution to the spectral density of that electron, for example, that band. If we take the other electron band, which we're proposing, you know, the two orbitals, we also get another contribution. And the sum of them, of the two bands, will give us the spectral density of the material. And this has dependence on energy and on the crystal momentum. This, for example, is what is measured uh, when they do the ARPES experiments. A photo emission uh, uh, angularly resolves, right? And there they can actually see, follow an electron through the material and see uh, these kind of uh, spectral densities. Uh, we also, of course, have a fixed number of electrons, uh, which in some sense fixes the chemical potential through this equation. And we use the Subaref uh, representation for the green functions and calculating the equations of motion. We are not entering into detail of the equations, but there they are if someone is interested. We're basically doing what is traditional, right? We are given one green function. We can calculate how it evolves depending on the Hamiltonian. And here we do it applied to this model. And you see, of course, it involves higher order green functions. And then you can do approximations for, let's say, closing this set of equations at Hartree-Fock level or at second order level in, in, the, in the perturbations. And that's what we do to get the different uh, uh, order and perturbations of the solutions, right? Uh, so this I'm going to jump. In Hartree Fock, the solution looks like this. So it basically depends on the mean numbers, mean values of the electrons occupying the bands. Uh, but the, of course, the second order solution is quite more difficult. There, that's the expression, which <laughs> of course you, you can program it, but it's the good thing is that it depends. That is something which not all the theories could so easily get. It gets dependent on temperature, doping, and crystal momentum. That allows us to describe a lot of things, which with other things. This, for example, is the kind of result we get for the spectral density moving along certain paths in the Brillouin zone, for example, gamma X or gamma M, etc. This is the experiment, and this is the kind of things we get here. So if you look at the let's say qualitatively, we are getting this kind of shape. You know, the maximum is following more or less this thing. And uh, also you get this kind of other things which some of these materials also have. Uh, this is just a couple of the materials. Right? So, so you can in detail look at one and you could adjust things in the model. We are basically not adjusting nothing. We are just putting from the start these kinetic energy bands. We looked at which, which was the optimal value of the correlation parameters U and V to, to fix this, which didn't need to be very large. As you see here, we put a, in this one here, U and V, 3.5 EV, and, um, and, and we used a very good high order to have precision in the calculation of the, the sums in the Brillouin zone. Um, but actually it was, Quite interesting to be able to describe that and also look at this as a function of temperature. Here, for example, we also looked at the Fermi surface topology. When we change the number of uh, a total number of electrons in the material, and we could see, you see, this was more or less what we're seeing at the moment from the experiments, but the experiments also uh, dope, and they also have this kind of transitions in the topology. So this model is allows to describe that also. And also one thing we, we like this, when they look at the chemical potential shift, which is also experimentally 
No, this is normal state. Yeah, okay. But you are this is the result results in second order perturbations. Yes. 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 We are not including phonons. It's just electronic model. Yes. Uh, so here, what one thing is that, for example, uh, we could, uh, with our present theoretical results, which is the black line, fit very well experimental results. You see, uh, in in this chemical potential shift, which they measure also in in, in XPS, I think, and in ARPES. And the LDA results overestimate these values by two or by four, depending on the calculation. So in some sense, uh, here, the correlations we're including allow us to obtain solutions which are even in the correct order of magnitude, right? Here, we looked at some details of the ARPES uh, for the total density of states, modifications with temperature, which in they, they don't see for too many temperatures. We included uh, some experimental results for a couple of uh, things. Uh, but I mean, all these temperatures we can assess theoretically and experiment is not like that. But the, what the, we like this is we could, in the temperatures they're measured, they saw the same kind of things. And we are giving them, well, if you want to look at other temperatures, this is the kind of evolution you could expect no? of the spectral, the total density of states. Yes. We also looked at transport in these compounds. Um, and here, actually, the samples was prepared, were prepared in Bariloche and the experiments by Gladys Nieva and Lourdes Amigo. And what we did with my PhD student uh, and master student before, um, we looked at, well, we have a model with two correlated uh, orbitals for these materials. And they had do, done their experiments um, uh, and they, they didn't know why, but they could fit their results just, uh, let's say, experimentally, just using a fit with two bands, which they didn't know where they came from or nothing. And so we were sitting with Jose in a talk they gave, and he said, okay, but you have two bands and you don't know where they come from. We have a model which is related to the microscopics of these materials, and it has two bands. So let's try to, to use our two bands there. And they, we could see that it improved the fit, and it also provided, let's say, a microscopic foundation for the bands, which they didn't know why. They had two bands, which explained everything. And uh, so here you see the data are the points, and uh, we then need even to use the correlations to the, the, the very precise second order in the perturbations. For this, we could use Hartree Fock. Let's say the, the lowest level of our approximation was useful to describe their transport results. Um, and here you see for different temperatures, the fit is quite good. And there, um, is the, some of the things that they measured was the hole coefficient uh, for, I think, for one um, high magnetic field. And as a function of temperature, and again, we could fit very good the results they're obtaining. Um, and then here, there's also this crystalline transition between orthorhombing to para uh, to tetragonal compound has, uh, let's say, some effect of the formation of the lattice on the electronic structure. And here, the points are different ARPES results, and this curve is what our results, uh, what our simple model gives for the same thing. So actually, it, it was interesting that, in some sense, very complex system, but the model is not too difficult, and it's capturing things which are useful for many experiments. This is just how we did all the calculations with the coup of formalism for the transport. And let us very quickly um, talk, uh, see a bit what happened uh, when we tried to apply this approach to the bismuth-based compounds. Again, here you're having this um, bismuth is the, the, the darker ion, the yellow one is the sulfur, and you always have a coordination of two sulfurs for one of these bismuth. And those are, let's say, these kind of planes hmm, in the structure. And uh, all of that family of materials which I showed you have these things present. And if one looks at thinking of applying the model, what is happening with the um, electronic structure, what, tells, uh, what does uh, DFT tells, uh, tell us? And here again, we see that in principle, if you look in detail near the Fermi level, Basically, two bands are the ones which are the main uh, appearing in these materials. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we could also, some. this is the kind of doping which is appearing in the planes, but I'm not entering the details. Um, let me see if I have. Uh, let's do this one. So basically, what we did here was say, well, we will look at this uh, 
uh, we, we are using. Bare bands would be the Japanese proposal for this material, two orbitals, uh, to try to explain the low energy physics. What we did uh, was, well, look at this. In Hartree-Fock approximation, it's the blue uh, dash thing. And our approach here is the second order uh, approach. No? So it's, you know, we have the two things, Hartree-Fock or the second order. And so for some experiments, and this ones also, we looked at spectral density, you need to use, you need more definition. So we need to use the higher order approach, second order, which is more complicated numerically, but well, it takes some more CPU time, but you can do it. And uh, well, we, we applied it for looking at the density of states, total density of states for different values of the correlation, the two different correlations, et cetera, just to see a bit how the model depended on that. Here we're comparing uh, our results, let's say, for the Fermi surface to experiment. Uh, these are results gotten for experiments. And, and you see, depending on the doping, we see the differences in the Fermi surface. Uh, here also, you know, see it like that. And well, we have this kind, depending on the value of U, we can also see how this deformation of these pockets and all these larger surfaces uh, appears. And we could correlate this with the results you have on the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, then what else? Well, here's also again a chemical doping uh, a shift, a chemical potential shift on the total dependence on the total electron band filling. And again, uh, taking correlations into account within second order, we pass with this was the only at that time uh, experimental data from photomission with uh, X rays. Uh, and all the other approaches, uh, DFT is here. So it was quite far from the experiment. Uh, and well, you needed this kind of precision and taking correlations into account uh, to be able to describe the experiment. Mm -hmm. And then what else? Um, there you see effects of doping. The, the good thing is we have a model which we can vary temperature, doping, everything. Um, and this other one, well, this was also some comparison with details in the uh, ARPES, which is not, uh, we're not going to enter now into that. This is uh, again, the view of the spectral density along certain Berlin zones, uh, which were at the time that there were no experimental results, or the world, one of these Terashima, that was the only one. That one we fit. And uh, Usui was the paper with the uh, two bare bands, which we use as starting point for the kinetic energy. And well, this is the kind of prediction we have for these materials. Uh, then we looked also at transport. Um, and again, here, for example, we see experiments uh, are the points, um, and they are experiments at different dopings. And so here, for example, uh, the experiment, uh, let me see, the blue one is the experiment at zero doping, let's say here, zero doping. And if they put the one which has the highest superconductivity is the 0.5 in this material. And that one, for example, is by the smaller points, which are here, the ones there. And here you see, if we use our model, for the kind of correlation values we have been using, uh, we see that the correlated uh, values, I mean, we are not changing them from one experiment to the other. So it's uh, really we are, we're having fits which don't have many parameters. No? It's mostly no parameters. Um, we fit them for one experiment and use them for the rest. And uh, we see that the correlated model explains very well the value. Hmm? While if we use no correlations, would be the bare bands by Usui, this is a kind of prediction for the transport, for resistivity. So really these correlations, which are intermediates, but are taking into account in this theory, dressing the bands, allow to improve the description. And here we looked at the whole coefficient. Um, and again, if we look at the whole coefficient as a function of temperature, uh, the experiment is this uh, diamond uh, points there. And we looked at different values, et cetera. And well, we find that the red one, for example, is one which gives us the best fit, which again is very similar to, in these materials, we had to use smaller values. Remember that even the temperatures and the critical temperatures are smaller here. So in some sense, um, it's more or less a third of the correlation values we used for the iron ones. But using that in the experiments, we could fit everything more or less. What we looked at, at least. In this qualitative way, of course, when one wants to look at some details, some material, you may need to add another orbital, etc. But for the gross things we, we, we looked at, uh, we were already 
quite happy because the results were quite reasonable, let's say qualitative agreement with many things. So let's say the message are perhaps related to this uh, uh, audience would be that notwithstanding the complexities of the systems which we looked at, we also try to do as you did in your own problems, uh, focus, let's say on a model, uh, we try to understand it, finding a simplified model. In this case, it's simple, a microscopic model for the electron part, uh, which is relevant for the properties we're looking, looking at. And so in this case, then, well, entering more in detail, we focus on the description of the normal paramagnetic sp state of these two li large families of uh, non-conventional superconductors. Uh, and basically our simple model consists of two correlated effective orbitals hmm? uh, for which what we did was calculate temperature dependent green functions, which allow us let's, to include, as I said, dependence of temperature on doping <laughs> and of crystal momentum. And that allows us to address a lot of problems. Hmm? Uh, and then, well, what it is of, depending on the experiment, we needed, uh, Hartree Fock was good for the transport experiments, but when we wanted to address the, the details of the spectral density function and the Fermi surface topology, we needed to use the second order uh, solution for the equation of motion. Uh, so more pre precision. But for transport, it was okay with just Hartree Fock. Uh, even in Hartree Fock, we noticed that the including the correlations improves respect to the uncorrelated case. No? We, we discovered, so they are intermediate, they are small, but they are there, and you have to take it into account. Uh, so basically, well, this is what I was saying about the self energy, uh, which we could uh, describe as RARPES. And here I mentioned the two kinetic energy um, starting uh, approaches by Ragu and Scalabino for the iron based ones, the, let's say the bare bands. And these are give, uh, Japanese give the bare bands for the bismuth based ones. And we added these correlations. Uh, so, uh, what else? Uh, we are also gave some predictions for the temperature dependence of the spectral properties. Uh, for example, in the bismuth days, we found the second conduction band minimum, which with ARPES, which depend on temperature, they could perhaps uh, have a look at. And uh, we also can describe the Fermi surface topological transitions. And for example, in the bismuth days, we found it's independent of temperature, the, the position and the doping at which it happens. Um, well, in general, we find that including moderate correlations improves the descriptions of the properties we have analyzed and even transport, as I mentioned. So this was a bit what I wanted to tell you. And uh, well, I, th I think the, the common ground with all the works presented is that difficult problems, but one can try to take out what, what, what are the main ingredients which could allow to understand difficult things hopefully with a simple model. And fortunately, this worked here also, like in your models. <laughs> okay, that's it. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you, Cecilia. Maria and Rafael. Well, first of all, thank you for mentioning the CPA. It brought me memories because I did my PhD. Ah. Well, we started looking at that uh, with, uh, with Rafael uh, there, actually. Yeah, he is the one. Um, uh, let me ask you something about the future. Uh, now you understood the normal state. I guess you are going to go to the superconductor state. Well, so the thing is, actually, we we try to look at this because a lot of people went directly to the superconducting state, and, and they're still all fighting because <laughs> they they cannot agree, and even the experiments are not clear enough for that. So we prefer to say, well, if this is working, we're trying to uh, let's say there are a lot of other experiments where this could also allow to understand uh, things which perhaps are not clear yet. So as a first step, we would like to see a different sim similar systems. And of course, this kind of approach, let's say, one could say possibly if other systems, electronic systems also have, in some sense, two relevant near bands near the Fermi level, this kind of thing and, and correlations, which could be the important thing, important added ingredient, mm -hmm. this could be applied to many systems, not mm -hmm. only. The... So I think it's the right way, but you, I guess you are going to do the following step. But what I wanted to ask you is, what do, what's your opinion about 
this idea of looking for organic superconductors and this old dream of having superconductivity in a almost room temperature or at least higher temperature. What do you think about that? Is that pos there is a possibility. I think in Japan, basically, that's where they're progressing a lot with those materials. And also there, it's not so clear that the correlations are high. And, 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 I mean, so perhaps uh, also some kind of models like could, could be useful. I haven't you looked not, at those. I'm not working on that. I'm not working on that at the moment, but you give me the idea. Because I can have a look and see if this is, okay. could be relevant there, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I am really surprised that this very simple model gives a lot, a lot of information. Uh, the relevant information for superconductivity, I think, is twofold. First of all, the inclusion of the hub of energy, which is positive. And usually to support that for superconductivity, it would be very nice to have a negative. That was in my thesis. My Positive PhD view. thesis, I, I worked in negative view models. Negative view models. But, uh, uh, urgent, yes, yes. but there is a lot, uh, let's say, people in the community who believe that the correlation is actually local one, if uh, not attractive. No? It's, the uh, other thing is the, the layer structure. This is something uh, common, yes. Uh, sharing with all this high superconductivity, superconductivity. And we know that magnetism doesn't exist in two dimensions, right? Well, actually, here, Sorry, in, the, yes, no. Well, I mean, the, the materials have these layers, but there is some small. You saw there are inter inter things. Right. So, so I mean, my, my weak question, connection with the rest is possible. Yes. My question is: Do you think you have the key ingredients to enter the fight for the superconductivity mechanism? Because people say, oh, no, no, they are not phenomes, they are spin correlations, they are this and that. But nobody has really. But uh, like, like, if you, like Julia, you want me to, <laughs> to, to tackle that problem? We'll have a look. I mean, but the thing is, there are already a lot of players and there are still uh, all, uh, all kinds of theories for the superconductivity. These, these compounds are ideal for that because iron compounds are not superconducting, really. But if you put them in layers, it okay, we, we can do it together, Rafael. We, we are looking for something new to do. You could go back to condensed matter. <laughs> very surprised. <laughs> say, very surprised of looking magnetism coexisting with superconductivity, which is actually physically, well, it's not physically impossible, but very difficult to understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, because part of the superconductivity is that they are diamagnetic. Okay. And, uh, I mean, I, I was, and my question is, could you illuminate me with the new ideas of how this, this, this structure we would have to look at it. is related to superconductivity? I mean, it, it is a starting point. If, you, you, if, you, if these ingredients are enough to understand the normal state, at least qualitatively, one could imagine to build up on those and try to look but at the superconductivity. The point is that if you are convinced that this is correct, then it gives you a real yeah, good starting point. To, yeah. to a good starting point. Yes, yes. I agree. You could also look at the kernels or whatever, mm -hmm. yeah, of the spin correlations, and then and then come out with a general mechanism for superconductivity. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is what to do. And in that part, in Subodhi, there are lots of people working from the beginning. Everybody started looking at that. So we said, well, let's look at the normal state, which has its own complications, not being a good metal, but it's a bad metal, but it's not an insulator. So. I remember in the old times, Mott, who was a uh, uh, Nobel Prize laureate, uh, he made a statement in one of the conferences that the blue semiconductors do not exist. Yeah. And that, I mean, he had to eat his word because and they found the semiconductor. And obviously, with superconductivity, our statement like that, superconductivity, layers cannot exist and then they are. Yeah. But I think in any case, there must be some, at least a weak connection between the layers. The main yeah. ingredients are in the layers, but perhaps with superconductivity, yeah, you is, have to add the interlayer thing. That is essential, thing. essential yeah. when looking at the Fermi level and all that and you're doing you could get a, a tour for that. Mm -hmm. Is there any further questions? Yeah.
Okay. Well, ju just a similar comment, no? the structure that you presented uh, is so similar to high-tech superconductors that one would uh, expect to, uh, in the so superconductor in the state, for example, penetration of vortex, uh, magnetic vortexes inside the material. And uh, well, uh, I don't know if the correlation then of the uh, superconducting uh, electrons in these materials is of the order of four several uh, nanometers. Uh, that you, you should expect this kind of thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. We could have a look. Well, what we are doing is also with some other experimentalists in biology, they are looking at the zero bias conductance and, and they are finding some uh, interesting, let's say, changes with temperature. And we are trying to apply this also there to see if that allows to help with things which you don't understand. Right? So. Anything further? Uh, let me ask myself uh, that uh, have these, uh, these superconductors, have they found uh, some uh, special uh, applications? Uh, in, in I certain... think they're mostly interesting because, uh, well, uh, they, they have this uh, superconductivity and, and in some sense, it's, uh, I mean, they could be, uh, they have some relationship, they're non convention So that, that's some sense, you have to think of different things at forms because, uh, yeah. So you, in that sense, it's a very interesting, let's say, I don't know if practical, they are the best uh, thing. But um, I think the, the iron ones are very easy to, to fabricate, the, the iron-based ones. Okay. So perhaps uh, they can, I don't yeah. know, of course, they're trying to mo modify them. Basically, in Japan, it's where they do the best. The best ones are mostly Japan groups. Okay. And in India also. And the other ones are done everywhere. The mm -hmm. iron-based are done everywhere. And so uh, on. I think they are more stable against um, the cuprates for the moment when they, they have higher te temperatures, but they think they, they break very easily. These iron ones are more, let's say, stable, and so, so they can use them better, bend them better without breaking. But the temperature is a bit lower. Sure. So. Okay. Uh, did you have, uh, Matthias? I saw. Okay. He can ask him in, in, in Bari Lodge. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Okay, uh, let's thank uh, Cecilia once again and give a big hand. Okay. Now, Jose Luis Jimenez Andrade, he did his PhD And uh, as you see here, it's going to talk about an application of neural networks uh, to analyze uh, data from a multidimensional perspective. So, go ahead, Jose Luis. Thank you. Rafa is not here, but thank you. So, okay. Well, as you already know, how this story ends. I will center my talk on the key aspects of how to use the SOM neural network to find patterns in multidimensional temporal data. But first, I will give you some uh, background. This is the, the map that Ricardo showed cho earlier. Well, in previous research, we had worked on the problem of finding patterns in multidimensional data. In this setting, we have entities characterized by several indicators. And our task is to represent, obtain a representation in a plane. And this is done by the SOM neural network. Uh, our, to do so, uh, we take advantage of an artificial neural network known as the SOM. Uh, with the SOM neural network, we produce these uh, maps that represent the similarity between the entities. This uh, spatial distribution in the plane reflects the spatial distribution in a, in a multidimensional space in this case, 
we have four dimensions. So uh, the, da the data inhabits a four dimensional space. The, the task of the neural network is to produce this uh, projection, this nonlinear proje projection, so that we can uh, see what we can do see in, in the high dimensional space. For the Renewable Energy Institute, we collected a set, a set of indicators over, over the last 37 years. In this table, each row represents a performance profile. Uh, this uh, interpretation of, of, of the multidimensional data, uh, it, is, it can be done in several contexts. Uh, it, for example, here that we have uh, higher education institutes, uh, we can uh, talk about uh, academic performance profiles. Uh, this is the case with the Renewable Energy Institute. But uh, here we have the profile year, year, year over year. So uh, we need to somehow discover pattern in this uh, temporal data. Uh, we normally uh, use line, line charts to, to see the time series evolution, but we suspected that the some neural network can give uh, more insight about this data. The SOM neural network uh, is a, uh, the self-organizing maps, I, I should say. It, it is a special kind of artificial, artificial neural network. We already saw this, uh, listen, this, here, this, uh, this name over the symposium, uh, it is made up of two layers, uh, an input layer of neurons that tra transmit the information to the, to an output layer of neurons. These neurons can be arranged in a, a rectangular grid or in a hexagonal grid. A key difference of the neurons functioning in this model is that its activity level increases as the neuron weight resemble, resembles to the input vector. Uh, also, the learning algorithm updates the neuron weight considering the neighborhoods in this grid which in turn drives a neuron specialization process. Uh, in this example, neurons of this uh, son of the maps are specialized in this kind of pattern. In this chart, its uh, ray uh, has an indicator, but notice that this other region uh, is specialized in this other pattern. Uh, uh, in, in this uh, other toy example, we have three-dimensional data, as you can see, with a well uh, uh, structure. And this is a train map. Notice that uh, every point of uh, A set is in this re region and, and, and so the others. Here, uh, this, this, this map is the output layer of, of neurons. The hexagons are, uh, represent the neurons of the output layer. By applying several algorithms, we can uh, take this uh, uncolored layer of neurons and uh, create these visualizations that we call knowledge map, uh, science maps in the case of uh, science of science. The most important visualization uh, to us is this cluster map and the 
components or dimensions or indicator maps. Uh, these cluster maps uh, correspond to, to uh, uh, comes from uh, uh, an algorithm, a uh, cluster al algorithm applied to the weights in the output uh, layer. And these colors are uh, assigned randomly or you can uh, uh, choose manually. But in the case of component uh, or indicators maps, this uh, notice that it is the same, uh, the same lattice, the same grid of neurons, but uh, the difference is how we color each hexagon. Uh, in the component maps, we use the information of, uh, of weights, uh, which inhabit in the same uh, space of data. This is the, the, the example of three-dimensional space. So we, we have uh, for each weight in, in, in each neuron, uh, three components. Uh, so we color uh, each hexagon according to the, to the weight, to the component, to the, yes, to the component of the weight. Um, in the case of, uh, of the Institute of Renewable Energy, that it is our, our business. We have uh, a sequence of profiles that we can think of as uh, the state of the system. And this, uh, this state or this uh, performance profile inhabits and six in a six dimensional space. Uh, we can imagine this uh, uh, an orbit, a trajectory of, of the system space in this uh, multidimensional space. And we can use the, the SOM neural network to get a representation of this trajectory uh, in the plane. Actually, it is a simple idea. Uh, you can uh, use uh, all the tools available, but uh, we soon uh, realized that uh, we we start starting getting uh, maps with jumps, trajectories that uh, were not uh, smooth or continuous. Uh, Look, for example, this, this uh, label 2004 uh, that correspond to the profile in that years, year. And there is a jump to this other side of, of the map. So we uh, uh, start in use, using uh, some pre-processing to uh, smooth the, the time series in order to uh, eliminate the volatility of the data and keep the tendencies. In this case, we use a, an exponential centering, centered moving average. With this uh, reprocessing uh, uh, stage, we, we get uh, better maps. But also, uh, we, uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, we're uh, drawing these line, lines manually to, to ease the interpretation of the maps. And then uh, we implemented a, an algorithm based on qubit spline interpolation to get this, this smooth uh, trajectory. It doesn't mean that the, the actual state uh, transit for, for every ex hexagon or neuron that it is here, it is just to give a, a, a better a, a image of how uh, the, the orbit could be uh, in the multidimensional space. Uh, all the details uh, can be uh, consulted in, in my thesis. There uh, are all the algorithms and the mathematics, also uh, the diagrams that represent these algorithms. Uh, you can use uh, our free software tool, Lapson. Uh, there, uh, it is a, a Windows uh, app, uh, and you can download it from here. 
we have uh, implemented all the, the algorithms uh, that I'm going to show here, all the, the, the methods. Uh, because we uh, already saw the institute, the analysis of the, inst the uh, Renewable Energy Institute, I'm going to present a work in progress. Uh, this is uh, Mexico's performance profile evolution from 1970, 1970, 1997 to 2021. 20, 20, uh, from this map, you can uh, uh, split the whole period in, two uh, in three periods, but this, this period uh, from here, here is like a transition period. So there are two main, uh, two main uh, subperiods. And uh, we can uh, use the relative performance between the uh, between these two periods to to interpret the maps uh, and look that in the first period uh, there is a, a, a there is a a, 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 major, a a higher proportion of articles in Q1 journals than uh, in the in the second period. Uh, and also uh, a better performance uh, of the general production. But then would, in the- Would you like to comment something on the indicator you're uh, using? Well, I, if, if uh, yes, uh, I, I would like to, I, I would prefer to, to talk in, in, in general uh, terms, but if, if there is time later, I can explain the details of each indicator. Uh, for this, uh, for the moment, uh, I think that that this average percentile it is a measure of, of a global measure that uh, the the performance of the of the uh, of the whole production. So in the first period, we have better performance in Mexico, uh, and the second period uh, show a decrease in these two indicators, but we uh, start started to get in better uh, uh, lectures or, or values in this uh, indicator that is the normalized impact, uh, as well and as in, in these other indicators that measure the proportion of excellence papers uh, produced by Mexico. Uh, this this other indicator uh, it, it is not clear that, uh, well, in this uh, year, 2006, uh, the, uh, we got the highest values. And then in the transition period, but, but after that, uh, look that we uh, uh, got uh, lo lower values. So the performance decreases in this indicator, in this other uh, also. And uh, well, this is what we can uh, comment uh, rapidly so uh, uh, about this this map this te this technique uh, can also be applied to to uh, study several trajectories this is uh, also a, a work in progress here we have uh, the the profile trajectory of uh, argentina brazil and mexico uh, for each uh, for each country, we have uh, 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 six indicators measured over this uh, this period. Uh, uh, so we have, uh, as Matias said, said yesterday, we can th think of this as a multivariate time series. Uh, notice that uh, Argentina and Argentina and Mexico started in the same cluster, but follow. A different path, uh, and Brazil, uh, who started in this other cluster, ended up in this uh, in this cluster of of Mexico, uh, and also Argentina. Uh, it is it is getting better uh, indicators in in this uh, in these final years. Well, uh, this is only a. a 
Another ideas that, that we can explore to use the, the, this, this technology to analyze temporal data is this, uh, this other technique that we call neural longitudinal mapping. Uh, this is also a very simple idea. We split the, the, the whole period in several uh, subperiods and for each one generate a, a knowledge map. Uh, so we can, uh, the hypothesis is that the, the transformation or the evolution that the data uh, uh, undergone uh, can be seen in these maps, could be seen in these maps. Uh, we, uh, we realized that the simple uh, application of the, new, the, of the uh, algorithm didn't produce well uh, a, 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 a sequence that could be read easily. So we have to uh, uh, make, uh, to, to come out with uh, some ideas to, to really produce a sequence that, that uh, were uh, useful to, the, to do the kind of analysis w we were interested in. Uh, this is a, a, a study we made with data of the higher education rankings for the uh, first 50 Latin American universities of, and uh, we use the indicators uh, that underlie the, what they call the overall indicator, which is a com compound indicator. Uh, so we have here five dimensional data. The ranking, <laughs> we have six uh, dimensional data and uh, we apply this idea to generate uh, the sequence uh, of maps. Uh, some, something I can say here, very interesting is that uh, in the, uh, in here, I, I, I don't have 2016, but uh, Brazilian universities, started in this zone of the map, but uh, uh, over the years, they were descending to this zone of the map. Uh, so in, in 2019, uh, most of, of Brazilian uh, universities concentrated in this zone. And the, uh, also uh, Chilean universities were uh, concentrated in this other zone. This is a, a general finding that I can say. But uh, here uh, you can uh, monitor the evolution of, of uh, single universities and uh, you can uh, also uh, look for changes in the clusters or profiles. Uh, another uh, idea, let's explore in, in our team, is to, to do uh, clustering with the actual time series. Uh, when I started my, my uh, doctoral research, the, uh, I started here. I wanted to, to cluster time series and multivariate time series. In these examples, know that, notice that our uh, uh, univariate uni time series it is, the, it is the concept. Uh, but, uh, in this uh, in this case, we have to change the the, the metric used by the some neural network. In the in, in the other examples I show show you, we use the uh, Euclidean metric, and here we have to de to define a, an adequate uh, metric that uh, can uh, uh, handle this this kind of data, which is a this temporal data, but. Uh, the student that was helping us with this uh, left. Well, th that is all. This is the people I think working with lately. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do, do you have any question? Rafa. 
Uh, right. So the main purpose of these studies, uh, statistical studies, philosophy studies, is to go deeper inside what is going on in the system, right? Right. So is there some idea how to improve the, the things or is just you know, taking a, a natural phenomenon and, and look at it and analyze it? Or <coughs> if there is a possibility of engaging some politicians or some people in power to tell them, look, what you're doing is wrong. You could do it better. Yes, of course. Uh, our in interest may be scientific interest, but sure, the results can be used to, to uh, advise people with the power of uh, making policies. And uh, well, we 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 need uh, some specialists that that could tell us if this is good or bad, uh, because in this case, are uh, we have um, performance profiles. Yes, there is a technique. Yes, you want do you want to say something? Yeah, Rafael, what you're saying is very important. And and actually, uh, when I started this project, we had that goal. And uh, it, it is a fact that our university that is large, we have many uh, centers of research and institutes, we don't have any diagnosis of what we are doing. And this is not easy because Scopus and the, the web of science, from it you can get the production, the production of the whole university, but it, it doesn't segment it in, the, in institutions. So this uh, implies work to do it. Uh, but actually, uh, going in, in that direction, uh, we were able to convince the coordination, actually the coordinator of, of the scientific research of our university, to provide us with, with a position to hire Ricardo that is contributing to push this, uh, uh, this, this effort in and we are very grateful of that. The most important uh, thing here is to characterize the clusters, because the movement uh, is the transition from a, from a, a profile when is uh, there are some indicators more uh, remarked to another profile when other indicators are in the in the play. So, uh, for example, in the case of resilience. There is a lot of uh, loss of impact in research in in right. in some way, but it's because most uh, Brazilian editorials are uh, a lot of Brazilian journals have indexed but is, are covered right now in Web of Science, and the first uh, impact of this in the Brazilian science was that this uh, main group of Brazilian uh, journals have low impact. And this has an effect in the in the in the global impact of research in Brazil, and and, and we can try to understand the characteristic of this cluster in order to obtain a, a, or to do a good interpretation of this movement. But is 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 the work that we, yeah. we are doing right now? But there is something that you can see very clearly, Rafa. You can see here that if if. Brazilian universities were distributed in the map and they now concentrated in this uh, region, in this triangle. It seems, and, it's, and, and it was something that made us wonder if there is a, a policy because all of them moved towards putting more emphasis on teaching. 
not as much in research. So the balance of the emphasis and on research and teaching changed. That, that's, that's very clear from, from this. I wanted Jose Luis to answer all that. But <laughs> yes, thank you, Jose Luis. I think I have a clear picture you wanted to say. Yeah, thank you.